Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Tuesday, February 14th, 2023 Placer County Board of Supervisors meeting. We will begin our meeting with the flag salute. Please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I see all my colleagues are wearing blue this morning. I didn't get the memo, honestly. I, this was just in the rotation. Before we start, I want to make a few comments. Uh, on January 27th, uh, we lost a just newly retired county employee, Matt Lewis, uh, through a tra tragic uh, automobile accident with no fault of his own. We had the service on uh, Saturday, and it was an overwhelming uh, amount of support. Uh, the place was packed. It, just, uh, you know, we had a lot of our county members there, all of his friends uh, that he went to school with, uh, and every organization he was involved in. So, uh, I, it really, really tears our heart. Uh, on behalf of the Board of Supervisors, I just want to extend our sincere and heartfelt condolences to the family as they move forward. Um, and I'm gonna be adjourning the meeting today in Matt's memory. And I would ask everybody for a moment of silence while we honor his memory. Thank you, everybody. We'll now move to our first item uh, on our agenda, the consent agenda. agenda. All items on the consent agenda have been recommended for approval by the county executive department. All items will be approved by a single roll call vote. Anyone may ask to address consent items prior to the board taking action, and the item may be removed, may move for discussion. Uh, I see we have 20D. Supervisor Jones, you wanted to pull that up? And is there any other? Yes, uh, could we pull 16D? 16D. Uh, yes, anybody in the audience? Uh, 17D. I'm sorry, 17? 17B. B. Uh, anyone else? Is there anyone online? I see that, Chair. Already. Uh, then I'll ask for a motion to remove the to approve the remaining items. I'll move approval of the consent agenda uh, without the other items. Whatever, <laughs> the, remaining items. the remaining items. <laughs> and I'll Sorry. second that motion. <laughs> uh, did you second that? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, motion by Gore, second by Gustafson. Uh, this is a roll call vote. Will the clerk please call the roll? Gore? Landon? Yes. Jones? Yes. Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Holmes? Aye. Thank you. Now we'll move to item uh, 16D. I'm going to go in order here. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I, I wanted to pull this item um, just to uh, both recognize the hard work that our planning commission does in total, uh, how important our planning commissioners are to, in service to our community, as well as our county staff and to the Board of Supervisors. I'm very pleased that Mark Watts was willing and uh, wanting to serve in this um, volunteer work for the community that is often not recognized. And I thought it was befitting to not only thank Anders Hege for his service on the commission and his departure, but to also recognize Mark for stepping up. We had 10 applicants for the position of which um, we interviewed all of those, and I am so grateful of the number and outpouring of support of 
public members who want to participate in our processes. So Mark has a great background, those of you who haven't met him yet, uh, in transportation, and I think that's a key issue facing our county moving forward. I think he'll bring great perspectives. And Supervisor Holmes, you appointed him to the North Auburn MAC. Right. He has been chairing the North Auburn MAC for a number of years. Right. So I also think it's important for community members to know you can get involved at a MAC level and move up and uh, into a, another role with the county. So with that, I um, would like to make the motion to approve the appointment of Mark Watts for the 5th District. And I'll second it. Planning Commissioner. You need to ask it in a couple of months. Oh, is there anyone in the public that wishes to address this uh, issue? Anybody online? I see one chair. All right. Thank you. Then uh, we have a motion, Justice and second, Holmes. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstentions? Hearing none, congratulations. Thank you. Now we'll move to item 17B. Good morning, Chair Holmes, members of the board, Jane and Karen. Rebecca Tabor, Deputy Director, for Public Works, but formerly Deputy Director with the Engineering and Surveying Division. Um, so I'm here to represent this item. This is the Placer Ranch Specific Plan Project Facilitation Engineering Services Agreement. Uh, previously, your board approved the Placer Ranch Project, also known as Placer One, in December of 2019. This item is the second project facilitation agreement. Uh, put forth by the project owner, Gen California Placer Ranch, LLC, to fund county staff time to enhance project implementation. The first project facilitation agreement was for planning services, and this second facilitation agreement is for engineering services, primarily as a, to have one engineer as a central point of contact to review improvement plans, resolve issues, provide consistency, improve process, process efficiencies, and to coordinate with other county departments. The project owner will initially deposit $75,000 towards this uh, service, and the county will draw down from this deposit to pay monthly charges as the work is performed. So the actions requested are one, to approve and authorize the Community Development Resource Agency Director or designee to execute the Placer Ranch Specific Plan Project Facilitation Engineering Services Agreement and any amendments thereto with Gen California Placer Ranch LLC to fund engineering related project facilitation services to advance implementation of the project. And two, to determine the proposed action is exempt from environmental review pursuant to CEQA guidelines section 15061B3. And I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Come forward, Richard, did you have some comments? Good morning. Good morning, Richard. My name's Richard. Um, and uh, I, uh, Apologize for not being too up to speed on some of the procedures. I would, uh, what I'm attempting to do is get some uh, project facilitation services to locate a uh, site for my thorium electric molten salt reactor location to generate electrical power for the county. The, the grid failure is coming. I know it's not convenient to talk about that, but at some point, uh, my project is inevitable, and the longer we wait to uh, initiate it, the bigger the problem is going to be. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any comments from board members on this item? See none. Anyone else in the audience wish to address any this, this item? And anybody online? I see none, sure. Okay. All right, then. Uh, if I will. It's been uh, moved by Supervisor Gustafson, seconded by Supervisor Gore. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The item is moved. Thank you. And now we're moved to item 20D. 
Supervisor Jones. Yes, uh, good morning everyone. This item is uh, uh, to approve a commendation to Eldon Luce for his advocacy on behalf of the older adults and individuals with disability. So in a matter of a, re of a commendation recognizing Eldon Luce for over 40 years of service advocating on behalf of older adults and individuals living with disabilities. Whereas Eldon Luce started his career as executive director for the San Mateo County Independent Living Center. Through his career, he led in roles as executive director of the first IHSS public authority and directed, administered a total of three successful public authorities, San Mateo, Contra Costa, and Placer counties. Whereas Eldon Luce continued his work as a dedicated advocate long after retirement through advocacy in Washington, D.C. to support policy changes, facilitating, planning, and implementing older adult and disability services in the states of Washington and Oregon and numerous counties throughout California. And whereas Eldon Luce has faithfully served for multiple decades with integrity, compassion, and dedication, and through his devotion and commitment has empowered thousands of older adults and those living with disabilities to maintain their dignity and lead more productive lives. And whereas Eldon Luce is recognized as a distinguished leader, champion, championing and participating in multiple groups, committees, commissions, and councils. And whereas Eldon Luce has been instrumental in bringing improvement and change to numerous issues facing the elderly and disabled communities demonstrated by his commitment and dedication in creating the Placer County Aging and Disability Resource Connection and completion of a needs assessment to advance development of a master plan for aging for Placer County. And whereas Eldon Luce exemplifies true guiding principles through his passionate advocacy, actions, trustworthiness, compassion, professionalism, and leadership. And whereas Eldon Luce has earned the respect admiration and gratitude of his colleagues as a leader with his strong sense of responsibility and dedication to the welfare of the community. And whereas the County of Placer wishes to join the Agency on Aging Area 4 in honoring Eldon Luce as an individual who has dedicated himself to enhancing and improving health, safety, overall well-being, and quality of life for older adults and persons with disabilities. Now, therefore, let it be known that the above commendation was duly passed by the Board of Supervisors of the County of Placer on behalf of the citizens of Placer County at a regular meeting held February 14, 2023, and hereby commends Eldon Luce for his dedicated, outstanding public service to Placer County. Signed, Jim Holmes, Chair of the Board of Supervisors. Thank you. Sir. Yeah, I, I wanted specifically to make this commendation to Eldon Luce because I served on the Older Adult Advisory Commission with Eldon when he was the, the chair. Uh, I was on it for six years and, and Eldon was chair for at least three of those years. And he does uh, wonderful things for this community and he deserves every bit of this. Thank you. Thank you for that honor. Any comments from board members? Already. Uh, any comments from the public on this item? I'm, I move we pass this resolution. I move. I make the motion. Okay. I'll second. It's been, the motion has been moved by Supervisor Jones and seconded by Supervisor Gore. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the item is moved. Thank you. <clears throat> now, we'll move to the public comment item. Persons may address the board on items not on this agenda. Please limit comments to three minutes per person since the time allocated for public comment is 15 minutes. If all comments cannot be heard within the 15 minute time limit, the public comment period will be taken up at the end of the regular session. The board is not permitted to take any action on items addressed under public comment. Please come forward, Richard. Thank you. Um, the board may recall back in September when I uh, proposed, uh, well, submitted a list to answer the question if my molten salt reactor project 
is so great to create electrical power, why is one not on a commercial scale and built? And uh, my first answer to that question is uh, the federal uh, high interest rates and the slowing economy answers number one. We're in for stagflation whether we want it or not. And answer number two is that the uh, uh, globalist and uh, communists um, intend to uh, take down our vulnerable, uh, vulnerable uh, electrical power grid, okay? And the balloon was a trial run, okay? With an EMP device attached to that balloon, a significant part of the U.S. electrical grid would be taken down. And uh, so they're practicing on how to do that. And uh, I'm proposing at least at the best we can do a solution. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning, Jennifer, Placer County. Um, I'd like to just give some updates on things that are happening. Um, in 2024, California will become one of the six states that allow um, human remains in composting. And I think this should be a bit alarming since we are a very large ag community. And I hope Placer County will make it so we label things that are made with human compost, if any remains are used in that. Another thing is the mRNA vaccine is now being moved towards animals, to vaccinate animals. And I'm hoping that Placer County will say no to this as well. We've seen a lot of issues come up with humans with this. And I don't think we should be experimenting with our livestock that feed a lot of people. We've just had that big train derailment out in the Midwest. It's killing a lot of the fertile farmland out there, a lot of animals have died, a lot of people are gonna lose everything out there. And I don't think this is the time to start gambling with our livestock here and using the mRNA vaccine on our animals because I'm sure there's no long-term studies on that as well. We've just also started adding more vaccines to the childhood uh, schedule through the CDC. And this is alarming for a couple of reasons. Um, we're trying to pass AB, I think it's 659 right now, which would make HPV compulsory to attend school from uh, eighth grade to 12th grade um, here in California. So I hope we would say no to that. Um, maybe Placer County would like to say no to that and give parents a choice on what happens to their students or their children. But the, the problem is I've been listening to talks happening in the UK and they're talking about making the mRNA vaccine or the technology in all vaccines. So not just in this COVID-19, but to put it in all vaccines. And we are continuing to add more and more vaccines to schedules for children. We don't have long-term studies on what this does to children as they age. Also adults in care homes are made to be vaccinated living in communities. And we are not looking out for the children we are not looking out for the older adults of our community by continuing to add more and more. Not only that, we're not a healthy nation. We have not gotten healthier with more and more shots. And that's not the only thing that contributes to it as I've talked about food and then there's air and water issues too. But we have to start saying enough is enough. And I hope Placer County will do that. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. <clears throat> Morning, Chairman Holmes, Supervisors, uh, Jane and Karen, uh, Wayne Nader from North Auburn. Um, I am hopeful that the action that you took at your last meeting will have some success as it relates to the homeless. It's important uh, that they are in an environment that gives uh, a sense of um, 
structure and uh, hopefully some discipline that may lead them actually to taking responsibility and accountability for their lives, which means hopefully change for them. I think the challenge will be is that the majority of them do not want to be in a controlled environment. So whether they accept it initially, uh, it'll be interesting to see if they stay with it. Uh, I would hope that uh, there will be encouragement to keep that moving in the right direction because I think that's, that's the right direction. Um, the concern I have is if this is now the new encampment, uh, what happens to the old one? They could obviously, if you did shut that down, because legally I think you can once you have an opportunity to offer them something else and they reject it. But then that is going to spread them throughout the, the uh, North Auburn and probably Auburn area, which I think then compounds our problem. I mean, North Auburn in particular has suffered very greatly in the last few years with the, the homeless there. I mean, this is the highest concentration in the uh, unincorporated areas of county where the homeless have been, and we've had multiple issues, whether it residential impacts or business impacts. So uh, I was concerned that you made this decision in Tahoe rather than having it here where people could really engage in the discussion and input. Uh, that's really critical uh, because, uh, again, I, the impacts are huge uh, and the burden is high. Um, I'm concerned also that uh, we've set a precedence uh, by uh, making this settlement uh, that uh, now the homeless will feel in their attorneys that uh, if they're in the slightest way maligned that they can come at the county and get another payday. I would hope that's not the case, but it certainly does have the possibility of opening that door. I'm concerned about giving them $4,000 as a settlement because um, every expert will tell you, you don't give them money. You give them resources, but don't give them money because that's only gonna to contribute to their destructive uh, behavior. Uh, and so um, I would encourage that, if there's some way to control that, I would don't put the money in their pocket. So that's my concern. And uh, I wanna leave you with this one thought. If they wanna change, if the homeless really wanna make a change in their lives, I would move heaven and earth to help them do that, and I think you would as well. But the question is, is they have that, it's the choice that they have. We can't force that, it's a choice. But it, I'm thankful that we have the resources to offer them to make that change, and I pray that they do make that choice. Thank you. Thanks, Wayne. <clears throat> Good morning, Mr. Garabedian. Good morning, Supervisors, Michael Garabedian. Uh, I wanted to comment about a fact about the grid issue that was raised earlier. In, um, in early 1980s, a book called Brittle Power uh, was published, and it's published by Amory and Hunter Lovins. And that book documented that at that time we already had a serious uh, national security issue because in, the, in the grid. And the grid has only gotten, of course, more dangerous to us. And at that time, the administration in Washington bought that very seriously as an issue. Uh, now, there's a 2001 uh, update uh, for the book, an introduction that points out later, uh, later administrations have not really respected that. And this is, I don't remember that that talks much about overseas or foreign, but the, a lot of that is a domestic, a domestic issue. So, um, be, and because Placer County is involved in long, long distance tra uh, transmission and there's hardly anything anybody can effectively do about it, at least I thought you wanted to know, without making any comment on the, on the previous comments, I just thought you should know that there is a resource that uh, by these very good researchers and energy experts uh, drawing attention to that issue quite a while ago. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Is there anyone else uh, in the audience that wishes you address the board under public comment? <laughs> Do we have anybody online? I see that online. All right, thank you. <clears throat> we'll now move to our first department item. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, thank you. Yeah, it's right there. I had so many things written on it, I crossed it out. <clears throat> okay, um, Chair, uh, CEO, would you like to make a statement before regarding some of the public comment before we go to this. Certainly, thank you, Chair. Uh, just wanted to kind of note, as the board is aware today, Placer County begins the soft opening 
of a first of its kind mobile temporary shelter to serve the unhoused population at our Placer County Government Center. Great thanks to our county implementation team of probation, procurement, facilities, public works, risk management, and CEO, who together with council guidance, established the shelter site and completed other program requirements over the past 45 days. Many of these staff are on site this morning to ensure an orderly and effective first day and will continue to oversee the phase implementation over this first week. Also, thank you to this board and district directors, many of whom toured the site over the last week as final preparations were underway, together with Congressman Kiley, who visited yesterday. The site consists of 50 heavy-duty tents with cots, sleeping bags, storage bins, and blankets. The site also provides shower and restroom facilities, drinking water, trash services, charging stations, and picnic tables. Supportive services such as referrals for drug treatment and housing resources are also available near the shelter and a county facility that will double as a warming and cooling center during extreme weather. The new camp is managed 24 seven by First Step Communities, a nonprofit with experience managing tent camps in the city of Sacramento and is intended to serve residents in the Auburn and North Auburn communities. Staff will be monitoring performance criteria and impact of this six month pilot project and probation, the department lead, will attend the next board meeting on February 28th to share highlights of the first two weeks of operations. As Supervisors Gore and Holmes are well aware, those serving on our Regional Homelessness Planning Committee have also expressed great interest in this program, and the county has been requested to provide regular updates on its progress and impacts. And as per the board January 24th direction, procurement is finalizing the RFP materials with an anticipated March 3rd public release date for unhoused services beyond the six month pilot effort. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me just say I was out there yesterday afternoon um, and I wanna give thanks to the Nor Northern California Construction Trades Association that brought some of their folks in to help uh, prepare the site. Um, Alan Green, who runs that, uh, was there as well, so I had a nice conversation with him. And quite frankly, I think this approach really looks promising, so we'll see what happens. But anyhow, I'm very encouraged. Okay, any uh, comments from Supervisor Gustin? <laughs> I just wanted to report to the board that we had a um, very lively joint MAC meeting uh, last Thursday night between the Olympic Valley Municipal Advisory Committee and the North Tahoe Regional Advisory Committee. We had 334 participants between online and in person discussing traffic. And I wanted to thank our uh, county staff. Rebecca was there, Ken Grimm was there, Stephanie Holloway, uh, and our ski area partners and CHP were there as well. Uh, to talk about a lot of the issues going on with the traffic impacts uh, in the area. So more to come on that, but uh, suffice it to say, you I know your inboxes are full as well with emails we're getting on uh, pot potential new development or redevelopment of sites, and uh, I just want to let you know that we're working on it and trying to come up with some solutions. Uh, staff did a survey, Survey Monkey monkey during the meeting and has those results on the website and more to come on it so just wanted to give you all a heads up and thank you for your leadership on that supervisor any other comments from board members seeing none is it okay to move on now <laughs> oh time very timely now <clears throat> we'll move to our 9 30 timed item this is phase two agreement of the ics Crime Lab Feasibility Consulting Services. Amanda. Good morning, Chair, members of your board, Mrs. Schwab, Ms. Christensen. I'm Amanda Flo, Management Analyst in the County Executive Office, here today to ask for your approval of an agreement with Integrated Communication Strategies, also known as ICS, for phase two consulting services designed to accelerate regional stakeholder engagement, partnership, and development of a Placer County Crime Lab. I'm joined today by Placer County District Attorney Morgan Geyer and Placer County Sheriff Coroner Marshal Wayne Wu, and by Jerry Azevedo from ICS. 
The District Attorney's Office prosecutes most serious and violent crimes that occur in Placer County, as well as criminal misconduct cases. Successful prosecutions depend on the timely receipt of drug analysis and DNA results. Currently, the District Attorney's Office contracts with the California Department of Justice, also known as DOJ, to analyze blood samples for the presence of drugs and or alcohol. The DA's office also relies on the DOJ to conduct forensic DNA testing on cases ranging from sexual assault to murder. <clears throat> Despite the fact that the DA's office pays DOJ to have a dedicated analyst for their blood samples, DOJ processing times for confirmatory drug tests, tests can range from 9 to 12 months or more. This unnecessary delay prohibits the DA's office from filing criminal charges in a timely manner and results in numerous court continuances before case resolution. Additionally, the backlog in DOJ DNA testing has resulted in severe restriction in DNA testing and lengthy delays in criminal case filing. In essence, the backlog in testing prevents and delays access to justice for both victims and for the accused. Discussions of a Placer County Crime Lab are not new. In 2015, your board received a presentation from the Superior Court and the County Executive Office on the Placer County Criminal Justice Master Plan. The creation of a forensic crime laboratory to service the citizens of Placer County was identified as a top system priority for streamlining and improving the investigation and prosecution of crime and for resolving cr cr cases more expeditiously. In 2015 and 2016, your board authorized contracting with Smith Group JJR to conduct a feasibility study to create a management and operations plan to research operational and facility challenges for both the Placer County Crime Lab as well as a coroner's facility. The studies concluded that Placer County is not realizing the advantages, the advances realized in forensic science over the last 15 to 20 years. Subsequently, on August 15, 2017, your board approved a series of capital improvement projects, one of which was the new South Placer Justice Center Coroner Facility. It later opened in early 2021. Last year, in July 2022, staff retained ICS to revisit and clarify the county's crime lab objectives, needs, and financial contributions through internal and external stakeholder engagement and data gathering. Outcomes from the six-month phase one engagement include uniform agreement among the Placer County District Attorney's Office, the County Executive Office, and the Placer County Sheriff's Office for an updated post-pandemic list of prioritized forensic crime lab services. They also received a consensus on the Tier 1 services that will possibly be at the Placer County Crime Lab. These include forensic chemistry, toxicology, DNA, firearms, and gunshot residue. Of note, other trace elements uh, for example, hair and fiber, fiber, will continue to be considered and perhaps added later. Latent, latent fingerprints are also still being considered. Additional results include high-level agreement between county stakeholders and key Placer One decision makers at California State University Sacramento on key activities and milestones required for crime lab facility construction amongst participating stakeholders and strong support for undertaking them collaborative, collaboratively for mutual benefit. Should your board approve this contract, phase two of this project is designed to accelerate regional stakeholder engagement, partnership, and development of a crime lab. ICS will work with staff to continue the momentum in planning, logistics, and management discussions. They will also seek additional funding opportunities and manage the completion of a detailed business and operating plan for the potential Placer County Crime Lab. I would like to make a quick note for the record. There were some technical changes to the insurance provisions of the contract that are uh, slightly different than what was attached to this memo. These minor changes have been approved by both risk management, council, and as well as the contractor. So that takes me to our action requested. Staff today request your board's approval and authorization for the county executive officer or designee to sign an agreement with Integrated Communications Strategies, LLC, for phase two consulting services in the amount of 248,000 for an 18 month contract for the period of January 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2024. And with that, I will turn it over to your district attorney for additional comments. All right, thank you. 
Good morning. Good morning, sir. Chairman Holmes, fellow board members, Karen, Jane, nice to see you. Good morning, Megan. Uh, just very briefly, um, I will echo uh, what was read in the memo by Amanda. The need for the crime lab, it is the one missing component to what I believe is the best criminal justice system in the state, I would argue the nation. Um, it is access to justice for both the victims and survivors and family members as well as the accused. Without timely results on the, the disciplines that Amanda mentioned, we can't get results, we can't get information, and that means people have to wait. And the one thing that the criminal justice system can't tolerate is waiting. Um, as we are too often reminded, family members' lives are on hold as we tell them we have to wait for information before we can determine how we proceed on a particular case. We have an opportunity here to create that in Placer County. The, this board's support is much appreciated. Um, we have a phenomenal team together right now working on this issue between our county folks, um, our Placer County law enforcement with my office and the sheriff's office, and our wonderful partners at Sac State. We have an opportunity to create um, something that no one else has done, a, a crime lab in a sort of teaching hospital type um, mode that will allow research, will allow interns, uh, and, and allow Sac State to uh, partner with Placer County for us to really do some cutting edge forensic services. Um, this contract will enable us to, to really put some more meat on the bone and really define what we are going to do and what we seek to do with this crime lab. We have spent a lot of time trying to determine uh, the best bang for our buck in terms of what services we could do, what funding we could secure outside uh, of the county, as well as um, some return on investment ideas with uh, partnering with other counties uh, who are in the same position we are with the Department of Justice and are looking for a local solution. And that is um, just within our grasp now with this board support. So thank you very much uh, for consideration of this and we are excited to move this project uh, one step closer um, to, uh, to actually getting this crime lab in operation. I'm gonna turn it over um, to Sheriff Wu for a few comments on uh, his, his uh, perspective on the need for this crime lab as well. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Geyer. Good morning, Sheriff Wu. Good morning, Chairman Holmes, members of the board, Karen, Jane, pleasure to be here. What an exciting time for Placer County. I mean, with the growth and uh, this opportunity and to partner with Sac State, um, it just, I couldn't be more excited. And, you know, you would think I would come up here and talk about uh, the criminal justice system and crime fighting and how this crime lab is going to help us uh, prosecute criminals uh, successfully and, and maintain our high quality of life that we enjoy here in Placer County. But I kind of wanted to bring up a couple of points that I think um, are other areas of our operations that will benefit from having this crime lab. And one of them is our corrections system. You know, the corrections system, our jails are the key component to having a healthy criminal justice system. We have to have that accountability built in. And since AB 109 and criminal justice reform, we've watched our population in the Placer County Jail continue to change and morph. To today, two thirds or more of our inmates are pretrial. So when you hear about our jails getting clogged up and we don't have room and two thirds of our inmates are pretrial and then you hear these eight, 12, 10 months turnaround time for lab results, that's part of the problem. And I think we could have not only a more efficient uh, criminal justice system, but we could have a healthier correctional facility and a correctional system and just speed the whole process up and make sure offenders are held accountable. And the last point I'd like to bring up is this. Um, and it's separate from the criminal justice system, but it's still part of our responsibility. A lot of our constituents, hopefully if we're doing our job right, will never come in contact with the criminal justice system here in Placer County. But I'm also the coroner. And unfortunately, a large number of our constituents at some point in their life here in Placer County may come into contact with the coroner's division. And we have to send our toxicology results out. And we contract with a private lab because it's much faster than the Department of Justice. But I have families that are seeking closure in a very difficult time of their lives that are very often waiting 8, 10, 12 weeks at a time. And with this crime lab, it will not only help the criminal justice system, but I think it will help the coroner's division of the sheriff's office as well, and therefore bring top-notch service to Placer County and what our constituents expect from us. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is there anyone else in the audience that wants to address this on this item? Seeing it, anybody online? Uh, any comments from board members? I see none. Amanda? Well then, oh, sorry. Is she oh. finishing up? I, no, I'm all done. All right, well then, <laughs> uh, thank you for your presentation. 
I think this is a great opportunity, and I want to move the item All right. forward, I'll, please. And I'll second. Okay, the item has been moved by Supervisor Gore and seconded by Supervisor Gustafson. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Better not be. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Good job, Amanda. Thanks. Ready for me to go again? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was just stunned by just the hanging presentation. Out. <laughs> okay, move forward. Yes. Okay, so good morning again. Amanda Flo, Management Analyst from the County Executive Office. Um, Wen Wu, your sheriff, is also still here with me. And we are here today to request your board's authorization for a donation to the Placer County Sheriff's Council in the amount of $50,000 to support the Fallen Deputy Monument Campaign. Since the Placer County Sheriff's Office was established in 1851, nine peace officers have sacrificed their lives in service to the community. The Placer County Sheriff's Council was created in 2004 and is a separate nonprofit 501c3 organization comprised of local business people. The council has recently partnered with local artist Doug Van Houd to provide a fallen deputy monument where loved ones and our community can pay their respects to the fallen peace officers and to honor their legacy. The council kicked off a donation campaign on May 25, 2021 for contributions toward this monument. An artist's rendering of the monument appears on the council's website and is envisioned as an eight-foot sculpture by Van Houd. When completed, it'll be placed in the rotunda located outside of the Auburn Justice Center with the names of the nine Placer County peace officers killed in the line of duty. We actually have a rendering of the Photoshop, um, uh, a Photoshopped photo or of, the, of the rendering into the rotunda so your board can get a visual of what the project will look like when complete. While the council has collected donations to fund the majority of the monument, a $50,000 don donation will help to close the gap. The council has asked whether the board would consider a donation of this amount to assist in fulfilling the council's fundraising goal for this campaign. Placer County's strategic plan identifies strategic relationships and community engagement as a critical success factor supporting your board's vision for Placer County. This $50,000 community support donation is requested to engage with the community in honoring the lives of Detective Mike Davis, Reserve Deputy Timothy A. Ruggles, Deputy James E. Machado, Deputy Arden Webster, Deputy Richard Alfred Shepard, Deputy Charles Carter, Sheriff William Elam, Deputy Frank H. Deppendender, and Deputy George W. Martin. With that, I would like to request your board adopt a resolution approving, approving and authorizing a donation to the Placer County Sheriff's Council, a separate 501c3 nonprofit, in the amount of $50,000 from the general fund to support the Fallen Deputy Monument Campaign to honor the service and sacrifice of all Placer County Sheriff's Office peace officers killed in the line of duty. I would now like to turn it over to your Placer County Sheriff Wayne Wu to provide additional comments. Well, good morning. Um, you know, I couldn't be more honored uh, to come present to you about any other initiative. Um, I can't tell you how much it means to me uh, to bring this item forward and to ask for the board's involvement, uh, uh, Jane's support. Um, but to my surprise, uh, it doesn't just mean a lot to me. I, I showed up this morning and I, I see Chief Estes and I saw retired Sheriff Bonner. And I had no idea that they were going to show up here today. And when I talked to them about what they had here at the Board of Supervisors, they were specifically here because this monument also meant a lot to them. Um, I could get into all the details about um, the planning uh, and what's gone into this so far, but I, I can't uh, say enough about the generosity of our community. Um, the members of this community that have pushed on this campaign. When I envisioned this, I, I thought we would start it and it would be you know, a five to seven year kind of fundraising effort where we could steer people that wanted to donate. Never in a million years did I think uh, in 2021 when we kicked this off that the council would want to unveil it in May. Our target date is police week in May. We thought that would be a fitting time to unveil this. Um, we wanted to work with a local artist. We have a world famous artist was the, uh, 
White House artist to President Ronald Reagan here in Auburn. So we talked to him about our vision and his vision and that uh, statue is actually completed. It's in his warehouse. That is a photo of the actual completed statue that he kind of photoshopped of where we envisioned it in the rotunda. What's missing is we're working with a Rockland company to, for the piece of granite that um, he'll be looking at, which will have the names of all the fallen deputies um, that have paid the ultimate sacrifice. So uh, I appreciate your support. I appreciate you hearing this item today. And, uh, you know, we make a promise to family members and members of our staff that uh, we will always take care of the family and that the fallen deputies will never be forgotten. And this will help us ensure that that's the case and be a place for our community, family members, and our staff to always remember the sacrifices that were made. So thank you. Thank you, Sheriff Wu. Is it just me or is, can I assume that under Sheriff uh, Wright's pose for that statue? Yeah, no kidding. It was over eight feet tall. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, he was the model. Um, <laughs> the other thing is uh, the artist, uh, Van Hout, Doug, oh, yeah. he, he also wants it to set up on a, uh, like an eight foot piece of granite as well. So it's going to stand even taller. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a rendering, uh, going back to our roots of being established in 1851 during the gold rush. The weapons, the clothing, everything is from that era. I mean, the, the detail is, is incredible. Um, and it's an incredible thing to see in person as well. So thank you for your support and your consideration today. And uh, hopefully I look forward to seeing you all in, uh, yeah. in May. <laughs> so please extend our thanks to the Sheriff's Council for their leadership on this. I know they've uh, worked really hard to get this, move this forward. Supervisor Gore. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sheriff, for sharing this with us, sharing with us the opportunity to participate. I think it's great. Uh, we talked, it sounds like you've got even maybe a larger delta than the $50,000 uh, with the granite rock to have the names for the, the deputies. Um, so, you know, I'm certainly happy to support this. What I would love to do and encourage my colleagues to do um, is since you do also have some additional dollars to raise, I would love to um, have the information to share with the residents in um, District 1. I think we all probably would love to support this effort to encourage our residents to give because to your point, you had shared how quickly the fundraising went. And that's a demonstration of the support our residents um, have for our law enforcement here in Placer County. So I would love to be able to get that information to share it out and I, I think that our residents would quickly be able to make up that delta of what's left over. So uh, I just really appreciate um, being able to participate this and encouraging our residents to participate as well. Uh, just one thought that I have and that as we look at taking funds from Placer County to give towards this and I know that there will be recognition of those who donate I think it would be appropriate to instead of it just being Placer County maybe it's the citizens of Placer County who give the dollars right because these it's dollars that we're allocating are our taxpayer dollars and I think that that would be uh, more representative of who's giving the funds than just the county as an entity that just a suggestion Thank you so much. They're all very good ideas. Um, thank you. I love the part about putting the citizens of Placer County um, on the sponsorship plaque that'll be in the rotunda to recognize um, whatever gift is approved today. Uh, I also appreciate you wanting to reach out to all of your constituents and help get us to the finish line. We have one more fundraiser planned um, by the Sheriff's Council towards the end of March. Um, when I talked to Jane uh, about this initially, we thought the Delta was going to be about 50,000, and that was for the statue alone. And um, it also didn't include, we weren't sure what the artist was in in-kind donations. He took $100,000 off of what his normal price would be to complete uh, um, a rendition like this and a statue of that size in bronze. But when you factor in all of the costs for installation, the granite, the inscription of the names, the, the bronze plaque that'll go in the rotunda with the sponsorships um, and the money we've raised so far we do have uh, some additional um, sponsorship requests that are out there with some different organizations that we're waiting to be fulfilled right now the delta as it sits is eighty one thousand six hundred dollars so obviously if if the board were to approve fifty thousand today there would still be thirty one thousand six hundred dollars to uh, 
a gap to be closed between now and May that any fundraising effort uh, you guys could help push would be greatly appreciated. Uh, I know the Sheriff's Council on their website, it's uh, I think uh, PlasterCountySheriffsCouncil.org if I remember right, uh, they do have, it's on their main page with a donate button uh, where people can actually, if you could refer to that link, I think they can donate directly to the Sheriff's Council through their website. And I can double check and make sure I get the exact website and send it to all of you later. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Supervisor Gustafson. Uh, I just wanted to agree that I think our residents will want to contribute. Many probably haven't heard or haven't had the chance um, to participate in a fundraiser yet, so I agree. And we can build an endowment because you need maintenance and, and taking care of this is so important to the future. So whatever extra we raise, we can put toward, the council can put toward an endowment as well. No, thank you. I mean, it's... Uh it's long overdue. It's been since 1851, and we don't yes. have anything to uh, yeah. honor the fallen. So this will be great and then live for hundreds of years moving forward. Thank you. Any other comments from Supervisor Jones? Yeah, I just wanted to add on to that how exciting this is for everyone, I think. And um, I was going to ask the same about uh, additional funds that you might need so that we can get it out to everyone and they can participate and join in this building of this statue in memoriam. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank you for that. Let us know when the fundraisers are. Thank you. <laughs> Will do. Supervisor Landon. Uh, I absolutely 100% support this, and I would like to move approval. OK. I'll second. I'll second that. All right. We have a motion by uh, Landon, right? <laughs> second by Jones. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Oop. Do you want to take public comment? Yeah, I'm sorry. Is there any public comment on this item? I just want to make it official. No, I'm, yeah, I was so excited about it. <clears throat> Anybody online? I no, I see none. So, again, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, any abstentions? Any, any no's? No. It's good. Congratulations. Let's Thank move you forward. So much. You betcha. Thank you. Um, okay, now we will move to our 9.40 a.m. Uh, item, parks and open space, uh, Andy Fisher. Mm. Good morning, Andy. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Pleased to be here this morning. Uh, we're here to talk about our rental fees for our sports fields. I'm here with Josh Hunsinger, our acting director, and with Dan Fauner, who is our operations superintendent, who has done most of the work in uh, in talking with the the uh, the leagues and coming up with the plan that we have before you today, um, if I may, I wanted to start though with just one moment to uh, add to the memory of Matt Lewis that we started with this morning. I have a stack of baseball cards that Matt gave me in 1978. Oh, wow. Our uh, dads worked together. We were family friends. Uh, we'd get together uh, to pick pears out of their family orchard. Matt was four years older than me. As a young teenager, he was already a sports star when I was an uncoordinated little kid. <laughs> and he had no reason in the world to be kind to me other than his legendary kindness and service goes back half a century. I was able to give those cards to my son about six months ago and tell him the story of Matt, having no idea that he wouldn't be with us in six months. But uh, I wanted to add that. That is who Matt was, and it's who he was his whole life. Thank you for sharing that memory with us. That means a lot to us and to their family. Thank you. With that, speaking of sports, we'll move on to sports fields and fees. Uh, this, act, this item before you today is to conduct a public hearing. This item was continued from January 10th of this year and adopt a resolution to increase Placer County's public recreation area rental fees over the next three years and to update the public recreation area rental policies. These fees are specific to our sports fields. They're specific to the leagues that rent those fields that we're talking about today. Now, your board's always emphasized the importance of efficiency and value to our taxpayers, and we've honored that. We've tried to give good value and keep rates low. We have not looked at, uh, we've not revisited our rental rates in the 20 years that I've been in parks. Um, and consequently, they've fallen well below market rate. And what we've discovered over the last several years is that they've become counterproductively low. 
Uh, you can see that our rates range generally from most of our, our youth fields, our, our youth leagues, between two and five dollars an hour. You can see up there, Dan began doing some benchmarking with different uh, jurisdictions around us over the last couple of years. These are 19 uh, 20, or 2021 rates. You can see the average uh, rate per hour for field rentals uh, ranges between 30 and 35 dollars an hour. Uh, and then the jurisdictions that have artificial turf fields put a premium on those in order to have a sinking fund for replacement because those fields are expensive when it comes time for replacement. We have two of those fields in our inventory, one in Loomis Franklin School and one at Olympic Valley uh, that we're looking at. Uh, we just replaced Franklin. We're looking at uh, funding opportunities for Olympic Valley. So looking at what's happened to the, um, to the market around us and the jurisdictions around us, um, two things were happening. We were starting to get a lot of pressure on our fields uh, from outside jurisdictions and outside leagues. And uh, so our locals are the ones that we work with a lot. We actually began asking us, will you guys kind of raise your fees? Because we're getting a lot of pressure, a lot of competition for playtime on our own fields because you were so you know, artificially low at this point. So that's when we really started looking at and you know, believing it's time to update those fees. Um, we also have found uh, that with rates that low, leagues just tend to rent them all day. So we're getting complaints from uh, neighbors, you know, people that want to come out on a Sunday afternoon, just throw a Frisbee around. There's no time left that's not eaten up. Um, so those are a couple of the things that happened. And we, so we, we began talking with our leagues. Uh, Dan hosted several town hall meetings with those leagues. We have uh, meetings with those in the West. So our, our leagues, particularly around Granite Bay and Loomis that have been there for a long time, we're seeing emerging leagues coming up in West Placer, Dry Creek area. Uh, and then in the east, we have lacrosse, we have soccer, we've got quite a bit of league play up in our Olympic Valley Park as well. So we talked to them uh, about what plans were, we kicked ideas around uh, with those folks. Uh, they understood the need to raise fees, but they did say, you know, give us some time, if you would, to acclimate our budgets uh, to, the, to, to the rental rates, to bring them up to market value. And so that's what we're proposing before you today, is a three-year staggered uh, increase. So we would take the fees from what they are today, uh, effective March 1st, they would go up to $13 an hour for regular soccer or baseball field, whatever kind of turf field you have. Uh, and then in January of 24, go up to $22 an hour, and then finally top out January of 25 at $30 an hour. And then on our artificial turf fields, uh, we would double those rates so that we could keep a collection of money for replacement when that time comes. So those are the rates that we have proposed today with the tables of how those would work in the back of your packet with you. Uh, there were also some additional kind of policy changes that we're recommending come forward. Uh, one of those is that we recognize the local faithful leagues that we've worked with for years. And so if you have uh, more than 50% of your roster within the community plan area uh, on the fields that you're playing and renting for the season that you could receive a 50% credit against those new fees. Um, we also want to recognize the significant volunteer contributions that a lot of our leagues give us, and they are very uh, significant. They will build anything from uh, announcers' booths to redoing infields, things like that. And we want to recognize that. That was one of the things that the league said, we can kind of give you one or the other. We can give you more money or we can continue to do volunteer work. So we wanted to make sure that we could continue to accept that, that valuable work. Uh, another thing we're asking for is a $10 charge for changing schedule. It became just a little too easy with no cost involved uh, to plague our secretary with constant changes, and that does result in a cost to us. We have to change uh, calendars on the website and the kiosks, things like that. So we just wanted to put a little marker in the ground that it does cost us something and reflect what it does cost to change schedules back and forth. Uh, and then finally, um, we wanted to have some kind, of, um, some kind of leverage and ability to respond to damage. Occasionally we get uh, some, some leagues and, and folks in those leagues that will leave paint out, leading to graffiti, uh, do some damage, things like that. So we're asking for the ability to keep a $2,500 damage security deposit. Um, we would keep that. Uh, the leagues did not um, contest the need for the, the security deposit, they, did, they were concerned that it could be used up on administrative, you know, just go toward administration. We said we would be specific in the policy. It would only be the hard cost of actual graffiti removal, actual damage repair. Uh, and then they would get any unused portions back at the end of the season. 
uh, or they could roll it over into the next year. And again, all of these policies apply to seasonal league renters. If you want to go out and you want a birthday party and a, and a pickup game on a Sunday, these don't apply to you. This is for the seasonal league renters. Um, so with that, um, we took this to our Parks Commission in November. Um, we actually had no comments whatsoever, wow. and we did get unanimous uh, recommendation from our Parks Commission to bring it forward to your board today. Um, so with that, I will uh, turn it back to the chair. This is a hearing, so I'll turn it back. Thank you for uh, your work, work on this and reaching out to all the uh, participants and using our fields and uh, actually making it a phased in approach. I appreciate that. Uh, Supervisor Jones. Thank you, Chair. Hi, Andy. Thank Good you morning. for that presentation. <clears throat> um, I'm glad we're finally getting to this because I know we, when we met in my first year was one of the discussions over uh, constituents reaching out saying that our local, our local teams couldn't get couldn't rent our local fields because of outsiders coming in and gobbling them up early on in the season. So, but my question to you is that on, on the old fee comparison, we have a variety of fees. And then on the new um, fee rentals, I, I don't see the breakdown. And I meant to ask you this when, when, when you briefed me on it. But the fields on the old chart go from $5, $2, $15, and $45. So on the new chart, it just addresses one fee. Is that going to be applicable to all of these? Yes, great question, and I meant to cover that, so thank you. Um, previously, we recognized a nonprofit versus a for-profit status. Uh, what we found is that, that doesn't, it's so easy to get a nonprofit status today that it really um, doesn't make a lot of difference. Most all the leagues that we, that we work with um, get that nonprofit status. So we wanted to just leave that out of the equation and bring them up all kind of up all on the same level. Okay, so then in, in other words, the ball field, the commercial, the $45, it's just going to be <clears throat> $30 for, I mean, thir $13 for everyone. It will, and I'll, and I'll mention this as well. We do have a formula that prioritizes local leagues over the likes of, say, a commercial uh, team that wants to come in from an, for an outside tournament or an out of area, you know, larger regional group mm -hmm. that wants to use the field. So we do protect our locals uh, in that way. We do have prioritization formulas to make sure the locals get first dibs. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Supervisor Gustafson. Hi, Andy. I'm sorry I meant to uh, email you and ask a few questions. So. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think. Um, the policy on the local registration, that's a tough one, as you know, yeah. to, and to, to monitor and uh, justify. Do the other jurisdictions do that same policy? So City of Roseville or North Tahoe PUD or any of the other ones? There are some that have local preference. I may need to turn to Dan to see if you, yes. was there anything specific um, coming up, Dan? Sorry. Yes. The, um, That's okay. Work. Um, yeah, the city of Roseville does have very specific rules, and we kind of use them as a model since they're our closest neighbor and kind okay. of our, not really competitor, but our partner in this. Um, they do specifically give discounts, and they do field priority. So what we do is we collect the rosters that has everybody's zip code. We don't get real specific, but we make sure that if they're residents of a certain community that they get priority. Uh, the unfortunate thing that happens is sometimes we have competing leagues. One might have 1,000 kids in Granite Bay and one might have 500 kids. Well, the bigger league's going to get priority over the smaller league. But we try really hard to get everybody as much time as we can. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Do we need your name for the record, please. Oh, sorry. Dan Fawner, Park Superintendent. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Thanks, Dan. Dan. <laughs> um, and then my second question was, um, when you talk about commercial, are you including in that, like, um, the private sports camps who are hosting? I, I know they do this a lot in the Tahoe area, but I don't know down here where they lease a facility for and run a camp and they charge pretty 
high prices for those. Yeah, the, the, we have dropped the commercial rate in this recommendation before you, so it is all across. So it's, it's just all across the, the rate across the board. So, so if they would not qualify local, for any kind of discounts, right? Uh, as the locals would, but okay. they would fall into line with the rest of the price. Okay, thank you. And then my third question was, um, can we get this into some sort of cola formula so we don't wait 20 years? It seems to me incremental increases are understandable to community members that it costs more each year yeah. Um, yeah. and I'd love to see just a, a smaller increase consistently than than some of the the biggies that affect you know little yeah. league and soccer and right parents have to go raise more money so and, and I think you know given that this is kind of the quantum leap and we did talk a lot about a cola and I believe our our recommendation is to come back in 2025 at okay. the end of this three-year period see how it's working and then maybe make any adjustments out of this leap. I know we've tried to move that way with all of our county fees and yeah. trying to get into a formula-based uh, program so that people can predict and know there's going to be a COLA next year. So maybe I'll get my permit in this year. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, okay, thank you. We'll try to give it plenty of time in the beginning of 2020. No, and so I appreciate the three-year stagger. I think that's a, a good approach when you have to make that big of an increase. Thank you. <clears throat> Supervisor Jones, did you have another comment? Yes, I do have another question for Andy. <clears throat> um, I'm just curious, um, Andy, I'm, I'm not feeling comfortable with giving the commercial ball fields the same rate as we give everybody else. Um, it's just my opinion, but I, I think that we should, that the commercials should be left at 45 for similar reasons that um, Supervisor Gustafson was mentioning. You know, in the event we do get something like that, a commercial, I don't know, camp or whatever. Yeah, I think we certainly could do that. Um, and, and if your board decided that you wanted to do that, I think we would just need to uh, do a little research on how today to define that. Sounds how to good. define commercial. Sounds good, thank you. Can I ask a follow-up question yes. on that? Thank you. And that is, um, Andy, are, do other jurisdictions, and probably like Roseville, right? Roseville has all sorts of tournaments, et cetera, that are on played on their sports fields, do they have a separate commercial fee? Come on back. Turning to the expert. So um, I was going to mention that the, even the commercial leagues that are travel ball, they're, um, and we see this a lot in Tahoe especially, they're, they're not so much leagues, they're clubs. Okay. It's so easy now for them to get nonprofit status that we don't actually have any leagues that are commercial. I don't even have any commercial leagues approaching us and haven't in the last five years at least because it is so easy for them to get nonprofit. And that's kind of why we started this whole process is we had, you know, commercial leagues coming in and, and same thing. So especially in Tahoe, that's, they don't have leagues. So that, that was a bit of a challenge. So yeah. they're all basically clubs. Yep. And even, even if they're higher level than just little league yep. traveling teams, they're a club. Yeah. And th they're still playing sports just like anybody else. It just costs their parents more. Yeah. They, and, and that's the irony. And this, this was the hard work we did on this was we have leagues in Roseville or in Loomis area that, that don't charge a lot, right? They, they might charge $150. Our, our little Forest Hill League only charges like 35 Right, and then you've got other leagues in Granite Bay that are charging three, four hundred, five hundred dollars per kid. So trying to find an even balance without, you know, making anybody suffer was was a lot of challenge. So, thank you. One more. Yeah, one more. <laughs> Go ahead, Sam. <laughs> well, based on the fact that we're dropping that fee from forty-five dollars down to thirteen. <clears throat> I think it might be the $45 is keeping those leagues in the other areas because no one has a rate as low as 13. And if we don't distinguish from that, then we will get all of those that are going to be charged higher, whether they're commercial or, or whatever they are. They're definitely going to come for a $13 fee. That's why I, st I still am feeling that we need to, to be higher there. Um, based on dropping from 45 to 13, I think that we're going to see a little bit of a migration. Can, can I follow up and clarify? Yeah, Supervisor Clark. Thank you. And that, I mean, I appreciate that point. If we're going to have residents first, though, if we do have a priority of our residents first, 
I think that that will um, actually benefit us. And I'm not sure what I've, what I've seen is when we have those tournaments come, like Placer Valley Tourism brings a group of people out to play softball or et cetera, they, they keep them um, at locations where most are nearby. Um, so I, I hear you, I don't know if it would make as much of a difference. Um, and, and maybe we see, right? It probably will take one iteration to find out whether or not um, how this change affects it. But I think if we have our residents first, that may address it. It's up to you all. Well, there is still some question, though, on, on the residency issue, because there are legal ramifications for actually considering residency. That's why they're going to just zip codes. Um, but whether it'll be a game, people will figure out how to play. And um, in the past, the reason we're even going with this is because my constituents have a lot of heartburn. They cannot, get, they cannot rent fields in this assessment, park assessment district, because of our fees. So if the shift from 45 now down to 13, that is going to be a motivator for this part because it's going to be way cheaper than even going to Roseville. So all said with the, with the residency thing and, every, and consideration, so, I mean, we haven't actually worked out a residency um, plan. It's just collecting the zip codes from what I understand, right? Yeah, I mean, and the we, can, we can get more detailed than that. We've talked with our GIS folks about, you know, receiving the rosters in a form that we can plug into yeah. GIS and compare them to our community plan boundary. So I think we can get more exacting than just zip codes. Well, uh, you know, Supervisor Jones, I was in agreement with you, but he said they haven't rented any at the commercial rate for five years. And, and I, I do see what some of these camps charge, especially in Olympic Valley and, and those areas, and it is very expensive. Um, so I'd like, us, I, I'd like to approve this for today, but have some more discussion on this whole issue of those kinds of camps, because that's not a league. That's, you know, these people are making their living hosting these and going community to community, and they do like a two-week block. And, and they may have a nonprofit status. I have a hard time. I mean, this is how they're making their living, but I guess that's how they do it. Nonprofit status. And maybe we could bring it back uh, next year to talk about more about the commercial. Well, this is just a hearing. Oh, right. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so it might be yes to consider it now. Okay. Supervisor Thank Landon you. has a comment. I, I just wanted to clarify. So in theory, these commercial entities they can identify as a nonprofit status anyway so even if it does go down to thirteen dollars they would already have been paying the nonprofit fee before which would have been considerably less so if, in theory they would be going up if they are going by the thirteen dollars is that right correct as okay. I yes, yes. Yeah. okay um then maybe i mean my my suggestion would be kind of alluding to what Supervisor Gustafson said that if we could check in in a year and if it has become a major issue say well maybe we need to readdress this but um, I would agree that if there if there hasn't been any commercial applications for five years then it's, it's likely they're going to maintain that nonprofit status and it'll stay relatively sim similar Thank just, you. yeah I just want to remember everybody this is my parks assessment district yeah. and my people all pay fees in here and so even to wait, I'm telling you, a migration from $45 to 13 for anybody, it's lower than most other jurisdictions. And this is one thing that's been very big with my constituents. And believe me, I've been, I've been a lot of them are, are letting me know their issues. So here again, I'm merely trying to stand up for my constituency, support my constituency, because we all will be paying the, the nonprofit fees. Yes, it's costing them more money, but that's not coming to my, my parks assessment district. It doesn't help my parks assessment district at all. So I'm looking out for them, and that's really why I'm doing this. I'm trying to re maintain some balance with all of these fees that everyone else charges. We don't have a separate fee for the artificial turf either, do we? We do, yes. It's double the yeah. fee for the artificial okay. turf. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I understood so it. It's, that's and right. I so agree. It's 26. I mean, I have people in Forest Hill, Applegate. Yeah. I have facilities throughout my area too, and I, I think what I'm compelled is that they'll go from the two dollars, as Supervisor Landon said, up to the thirteen instead of, 
thinking about it. I was thinking about the way you were, that it's coming down from 45 to 13, but it's actually going from 2 to 13. Since yeah. no one's been paying the 45 for several yeah, years. No yeah, one's, no one's been paying the 45. Yeah, all the commercial leagues get nonprofit status. And then it, pay the $2 yeah, more. Yeah, it's super easy to get online. It's fast, and th that's part of the motivation why we did this. And this big influx started when COVID started, and we were one of the few communities that kept our fields open for the kids. Um, and we had a huge influx. We went from 25 leagues to 36 leagues in the COVID year. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them have dropped off and gone back to their communities as soon as their fields open back up. But we're still faced with this. And honestly, in the Granite Bay area, the Granite Bay leagues are so large that because they get priority, it would be very difficult for an outside league or a commercial league to come in and get any field time. I just returned four or five refusals this morning and said, nope, we're full in Granite Bay, so. Okay. Good. Uh, My only other comment, um, oh. Chair, yeah, go ahead. would be, I'd like to take a look at uh, everyone else's fees next year, about this time, to Certainly. see if they're all increasing and see what, at what rate they're increasing to make sure that we're in line with their increases. Certainly. We do most of our uh, year scheduling in October, November for the following fiscal year. So we'll know what the pattern looks like for 2024 at the end of 23. So we'd be happy to come back and report on how this affects things about this time next year. Okay. Is there any public comment on this item? Oh. Uh, this is a public hearing, so I'm gonna open the public hearing. Now I'll ask for any public comment. Seeing none, is there any online? I see that online. There's none online as well. Okay, before we move forward, I just want to thank you, Andy, for your work on uh, this Newcastle School field. Dan, thank you for that. That's a field that's been dormant for more than 20 years, and it's all ready. All we have to do is uh, refresh it, and it'll give us more space, particularly for the residents in Newcastle, Penryn area. So thank you for that. So now uh, I'm going to close the public hearing and we're going to be asked to determine the proposed action is exempt from environmental review pursuant to California Environmental Quality Act guidelines and adopt a resolution to increase Placer County public recreation area rental fees over the next three years and to update the public rent, the PRA rental policies. It's been moved by Gustafson, second by Gore to move the item. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Fisher. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Now we'll move to our, hey, pretty, pretty much on time. We'll move to our 10.15 a.m. This is a Board of Supervisors a proclamation for February 2023 Grand Jury Awareness Month. Uh, are there any representatives from the Grand Jury here today? All right, let's see. I see uh, Barbara Ferguson, the former foreperson, Margot Cave, Linda Cook, Gail Graybeal, Sue Kukrell, Lisa Rose, Sweezy Tucker, did I get that right? Susie. Huh? Susie. Oh, Susie. Mm -hmm. Tim Worley. All righty. Also Al Witten and Carol Witten. Oh, okay. Oh, thank you. All right. Well, I'm going to start by reading this proclamation into the record, and then we'll ask you for any comments or uh, any issues of that nature. So this is a matter of a proclamation recognizing February 2023 as Grand Jury Awareness Month in Placer County. Whereas every year in each of California's 58 counties, 19 ordinary citizens take an oath to voluntary, voluntarily serve a term of one year as grand jurors. And whereas grand juries have been in existence since the adoption of California's original constitution, in 1849-1850. And whereas grand juries conduct their investigations under the auspices of the Superior Court of California 
and have broad access to public officials, employees, records, and information. One of the most important functions of a grand jury is to review the operations of the officers, departments, and agencies of, of local government. And whereas grand juries are charged with investing, investigating and reporting on local government operations to ensure that their responsibilities are being fulfilled legally, efficiently, and honestly in the best interest of the public. Grand juries serve as a watchdog authority on well-suited to the effective investigation of local governments because they are independent bodies operationally separate from the entities and officials they investigate. And whereas the grand jury's fact-finding efforts result in reports that can contain specific recommendations aimed at identifying problems and offering ways to improve government operations and enhance the responsiveness, and whereas the hard work done by grand juries has a great effect on our communities and makes California a better place to live. And whereas the reward of being a grand juror is the satisfaction received from working with fellow residents and community members to improve local government for all. And whereas in 2009, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger declared February to be grand jury, to be California Grand Jury Awareness Month, and whereas it is appropriate to recognize those jurors, both past and present, who have volunteered their time and service to Placer County Grand Jury. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the above proclamation was duly passed by the Board of Supervisors of the County of Placer on behalf of the citizens of Placer County at a regular meeting held February 14, 2023, proclaiming the month of February 2023 as Grand Jury Awareness Month. So now uh, I'll need a motion to uh, approve this before we go. Second. Okay, it's been moved by Supervisor Jones, second by Supervisor Gustafson. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All righty. Now, is, do you have any comments? Uh, yes, good morning, uh, Chair, Chairman uh, Jim Holmes, Board of Supervisors, the sitting grand jurors, members of the Placer County Grand Jurors Association and the general public. I am Al Witten. I'm the president of the PCGJA, which is the Placer County Grand Jurors Association. I served on the 2009-2010 Grand Jury. In 2011, a group of seven of us from the Grand Jury, as former members of the Grand Jury, formed Placer County Grand Jurors Association, known as the PCGJA. We support the efforts of the sitting grand jury each year. Through our outreach, we help educate the public about the civil grand jury system throughout the state of California, and in both here and specifically in Placer County. We assist in recruiting citizens for service in the grand jury. And we provide implementation review of the grand jury's past recommendations. By the Board of Supervisors issuing the proclamation of the Grand Jury Awareness Month in both past and the current year, you have demonstrated your shared support for the grand jury's ongoing efforts to improve our local government, our cities, and our county offices and organizations. We thank you. Thank you all. I am followed by the four-person of the sitting grand jury, Barbara Ferguson. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Some of you I've already seen at our meetings, <laughs> and a couple of you we'll see on Thursday. Um, so like the proclamation says, 19 citizens are randomly selected each July. Um, they do sign up for a one-year commitment when and just so you guys know we spend anywhere from 40 to 60 hours a month in meetings doing interviews investigations are they shaking their heads <laughs> um and those all of that does come down to the reports that we write typically 
Um, there are anywhere from seven to 10 reports issued each year from the grand jury. Um, those are published in June. And um, thank you for recognizing us and our hard work. I guess what I'd like is for you to continue that support. Um, I know that the Superior Court just released a press release saying that we are currently recruiting for next term. I know some of you put that on your um, newsletters that go out to your citizens. I would ask that all of you do that. Um, sometimes it's a little hard to impanel 19 jurors and have any alternates left over. So any help you guys can do would be greatly appreciated. The second thing would be in June when our reports are released, that you again, in your newsletters, thank the jury and put a link to the reports so that the citizens of the county can actually see our work, what we're doing. So thank you again. We appreciate the uh, recognition. Uh, thank you. On behalf of the board, I just want to thank all of the jurors, past and present, that take the time out of their lives in order to do this important work and give up, you know, 40 to 60 hours a week or a month is quite impressive, so I appreciate that. Is there anyone else in the public that wishes to address this issue? And anybody? Come on, say something, no? <laughs> anyone online? All righty, then uh, we have a motion that's been approved. So I'm going to bring this down. Okay. Did you want to have your fellow jurors yes. come and join you? These are the ones that aren't in a meeting right now. <laughs> really? Now we'll move to our 1025 timed item, Community <coughs> Development Resource Agency, additional funding for the Workforce Housing Preservation Program. Crystal Jacobson, hello. Thank you, good morning Mr. Chairman and members of the board, I'm Crystal Jacobson with the Community Development Resource Agency in Tahoe. Here today with a funding request um, to provide additional funding for the county's Workforce Housing Preservation Program. By way of background, uh, your board approved this program back in February of 2021, and then we had a soft launch of the program in July 2021. <clears throat> so the program is an incentive-based program that facilitates housing for the local resident workforce. It provides grants to home buyers in exchange for deed restricting their home to the local workforce. So the deed restriction limits, essentially limits the occupancy of the home to uh, local workers. This is a countywide program, but today's funding request is for um, funding for East, specifically for East Placer. So in recognizing the need for affordable local workforce housing in East Placer and the benefit, the public benefit of um, providing that housing, your board approved an initial 500,000 in funding for East Placer, and that was comprised of general fund dollars as well as transient occupancy tax funds. So that was back in um, 2021. Uh, the program goal is really to deed restrict as many homes as possible to create a secondary market for local workers. So essentially the, the deed restriction 
equates to about 16 or 18 percent of the home value. So it lowers the, the home value um, and then provides a lower home that would be available to future local workers. <clears throat> the program provides up to 150,000 to qualified um, home buyers in exchange for restricting their home. The funding uh, is not a loan. Uh, it does not uh, have to be reimbursed. So it's really a grant uh, to these folks. So originally, home buyers were required to meet local workforce and income restrictions. However, um, back in July of 2022, we came to your board to make some modifications, and that was really to kind of counteract the rapidly increasing home prices during COVID. So we saw a huge um, rise in home prices in Tahoe, as we did countywide, but really in Tahoe. So we made a couple of adjustments to the program um, back in June, last, last June, uh, which really relaxed the qualification requirements and I will say has helped <clears throat> to um, unlock some housing for local workforce. So to date, we have enabled three local workers uh, to purchase deed restricted homes in the North Tahoe area at a total cost of 390,000. So that's about 78% of the committed, the initial uh, funds that were committed to the program. So we have about 110 left. Um, at this time, we've got 33 additional households that have qualified, so they're on a list. They're actively looking for homes. Um, and we hope that you know, in the spring, summer, as the real estate market kind of unlocks a little, that um, uh, we have funds available uh, to continue to offer grants to uh, local workers. So that's really the reason for today's request. Um, we do, um, we are requesting $600,000 in reserve transient occupancy tax funding for the program, which per would provide funding for an estimated four more home purchases. Um, and they're about, again, $150,000 uh, per grant. We are working right now with the PIO's office on um, some marketing. So we are looking to highlight the recent recipients um, and get kind of get a story out on, um, on the success of the program. And then we are also continuing to seek other funding opportunities to grow the program. So working with, um, I'm working with the county executive office on that and uh, looking to um, secure additional funds to hopefully house the additional, you know, 33 folks that are on the list. We do, uh, we set a goal initially of, um, of doing 40 homes per year. But again, uh, COVID hit and the real estate prices really skyrocketed. And so it's been a little bit of a challenge. Um, but we do want to, you know, keep funding the program, and the goal is to continue to, you know, secure homes for those folks that are on the list. So with that, we do request your board take a number of actions that are highlighted in your board packet. <clears throat> the first is to approve allocation of 600000 in transient occupancy tax reserve funds. The second is to approve a fiscal year 2022-23 budget amendment. It's AM00779 in the amount of 600000 increasing expenditure authority and CC10020, the Tahoe Economic and Community Enhancement Fund, and canceling reserves, and FD10201, the Tahoe Economic and Community Enhancement Fund, by the same amount. Um, the next section is to approve a fiscal year 2022-23 budget amendment, AM00778, for the CC06006 community development grants and loans in the amount of 600,000. So essentially that's a transfer of those funds. Um, and then the final um, action is to determine that the proposed actions are not pursuant uh, to CEQA guideline section uh, 15378B. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. And we also have uh, other folks in the room from the County Executive Office here today and Cedra to answer questions if I can't do, if I can't answer them, so. <laughs> okay, thank you, Crystal. Supervisor Gustafson. Thank you. Um, thanks for bringing this forward. I'm so excited we have three. I mean, last year it seemed like it was going so slow, so a three is a big jump. <laughs> and um, 33 on the list. And I, I think what's so important about this program is first getting people, obviously, in housing, but secondly, giving young people hope that maybe we're, they can stay and build a career and build a family um, in our community. And so that's part of the reason. With 33 on the list, we have a ways to go to fund all of those. But giving hope to others that if they can continue to save and that there will be hope for them to be able to buy a home in the area. Um, I think that hope is a really important thing right now. So 
uh, I, as I go to meetings, you, you know, you hear the pessimism of I'll never be able to afford it here, so I might as well not work here at all. And that's affecting our own workforce. We're going to talk about bus drivers in a little bit. It's affecting our own workforce, uh, the county's workforce, as well as our community overall. So strongly support it, especially given that source of money. My one question is, is there an opportunity, just like we talked about a, a little while ago with law enforcement recognition, can we partner with a nonprofit for community members? We have a lot of community members who may be interested in donating or giving or helping, but can't do enough to do one, adopt a worker on their <clears throat> own, but would donate to a cause um, that would help people put down payments down. So I just, I put that out there. I know we're forming a new nonprofit. I don't know if this is on their radar or if the Housing Trust Placer, but I, I do think there's a lot of generosity in our community that might be willing to write a check that will build up in time to help further this cause. Yeah, no, I think that's great. We are, I, I do believe they are familiar with the program, the okay. nonprofit that's being formed, and so have been in discussions with them about those types of partnerships. I mean, I think it's important to leverage funds wherever we can, right, to grow the program. So um, absolutely, we, we will look to do that. And I, and I really want to put a push in to our board of realtors, if they're listening. Every closed sale for a non-local resident put some money in a nonprofit to help get a local in housing. That's my plug today. <laughs> Supervisor Landon, you had a comment. Yeah, I have a couple questions, more for my own education than anything else. So um, is the are the deed restrictions in perpetuity or are they for an ex 55. It's a 55-year restriction. Okay. And then is it possible for someone to get out of a deed restriction? They, they can get out, yes. Um, if they do, there is, um, they have to pay, pay an interest. Um, and so it's not, um, you know, it's kind of unattractive, really. Um, but they, they, can, they can get out of it. They're just, there's, a, there's a payment that's made for that. And that interest is based on cost of housing. Yeah, CPI. so it's calculated at 3% per year from the date oh. of the restriction. Um, or the original, they have to pay back the original deed restriction plus a rate of appreciation on the fair mar market value. So it's a bit of a hit to, to get out. Okay. Um, and at the 55 years, can I correct, isn't it true that if they sell, it renews for another 55 years on the next owner? So the, it is, they, in fact, in perpetuity, unless you live a really long time. Okay. <laughs> yes, Sean is saying. I believe that was right, there, the program, that was my so, concern yes. that 55 years is a long time for me, but mm -hmm. for a young person, maybe they'll see that, and so. Right. Okay. Supervisor Landon, you uh, got some more comments. Yeah. Yes. Uh, a couple more things. Um, so, just kind of as a free market person, uh, one of my questions is: Has there ever been research or studies on how these types of deed restrictions impact the rest of the housing market? for everyone else, I guess I would. Yeah, so we haven't done that ourselves. I will say there is a provision in the guidelines that requires us to adaptively manage the programs. That's why we came forward last year with some modifications. And, and so we continue to do studies, you know, in the, in the housing market in general in East Placer. And so that's something that we'll look at. Um, this program was modeled off of a program in Vail. It's called the Vail Indeed. And um, they have They've done studies, and I, I don't know that I can speak specifically to the findings in their studies, but this is something that we intend to uh, review, monitor, and adaptively manage. So that's, that is something that we would be looking at, is what is it doing to the, house, you know, to the region in East Placer. I will say the town of Truckee has modeled a similar program and adopted it. Um, and so we continue to discuss with them you know, what's happening in, you know, there, there are partners you know, next door. and so. Um, how, is the, how is this affecting their housing market? And so we will continue to kind of have those discussions and analyze that moving forward. But you know, with only three um, restrictions made to date, it's a little hard to, to really know what it's gonna look like moving yeah. forward. Okay, and then just one last thing. I was also going to ask about whether there were nonprofits and currently engaged and involved, and so I would definitely support looking into whether Housing Trust Placer or this other nonprofit, obviously that's being formed, could be involved to kind of help bear that burden since I think the private sector can do such a better job than the government in general. No offense to any of us, no. but. <laughs> 
Absolutely. I mean, I think that's the intent is to look for these opportunity, partnership opportunities to help with all, really all the programs that we're developing um, in East Placer um, and West Placer, right? Um, so I would say I agree. We agree with that. Um, but the county would, I think it's important to note that the county would continue to hold the restriction. Right. Um, but look for um, those partners to help um, really administer a program. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Supervisor Gore. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it, Crystal. And I, I think uh, a, a couple things, if somebody is coming in and listening to this discussion, it's like, oh, they're going to spend this money and give free money to help people get in housing, right? But uh, a couple things I think are really important. One, these are TOT dollars, right? So dollars that outsiders have paid to come visit and enjoy uh, East Plaster County, right? So this is an opportunity to make sure we keep our residents um, in or our our own employees who live in the who work in the area a place for them to live and then this is one of many tools that we are trying to implement with lots of partners in East Placer to find ways to get more housing and so I just I say that because when people look at this they think oh, that's a lot of money and, and it is but this is a small amount to help in one way and then we've got lots of other opportunities that we are working on along with the town of Truckee and our partners in the, the hospital systems, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, I'm supportive of this. And I just have to reiterate, I really appreciate the idea about uh, nonprofits and asking the private sector and really love the idea um, about the realtors because a lot of realtors and mortgage companies will give a portion back to somebody's favorite nonprofit. Um, and that's great, right? Well. Maybe this nonprofit can be a favorite nonprofit that a mortgage company might give back to or a real estate agent might give back to to keep dollars in our community to help our, our employees find housing. So I just think excellent ideas that we can encourage folks to help us partner with. Great. Good comments. Thank, thank you. you. Supervisor Gustin. <clears throat> um, real quick, I, I thank you for that. And speaking to the free market, one of the issues that's driven our prices up is the absolute controls on any new subdivisions or growth that make it so hard even for us to get our Dollar Creek project going. And so, so I, I agree, but then I have to go, well, but we've created an artificial market up there through environmental restrictions so that the prices have escalated far beyond what locals can afford. Um, and my husband and I were just talking about this last night. We couldn't afford our house today on our incomes, right? But, you know, we're grateful for the <clears throat> equity we've built, but we want to stay. So, yeah. you know, we can't get out of it that quick. But how do we help young people have that hope and dream that, that we all wanted? So. Yeah, and I think in Tahoe, I mean, our, we have a lot of housing stock, but it is locked up in second homes right now. So about 80% um, of the homes in Tahoe are our second homes and so I think this is a recognizing you know that infrastructure that is is already constructed right that you don't have to go out and um, and construct you know the new housing so um, yeah it's a great program already is there anybody in the public that wishes to address this on this item seeing none anyone online okay well first of all let me thank you for reading the action requested into the record <laughs> So I will move all those actions requested that Crystal read, so I don't have to reread them. <laughs> and I will second the motion. All righty, it's moved in by Supervisor Gustafson, second by Supervisor Gore. Will all those in favor please? Roll call. Oh, roll call vote, that's right, you wrote it down, huh? Landon? Yes. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Gore? Aye. Holmes? Aye, thank you. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Now we'll move to our 1035 timed item, facilities management, mid-year update for fiscal year 2022-23 five-year capital improvement plan for facilities management. This is to receive a presentation on the status of our five-year capital improvement plan for facilities. Mr. Steve Newsom presenting. Good morning um, and happy Valentine's Day to all of you. I am Steve Newsom, uh, Director of Facilities Management, and I have a 
PowerPoint presentation on our mid-year capital update. <clears throat> I wanted to start this off with uh, showing you some of the significant milestones I'm sure that you all recall um, that have occurred over the past year. Um, our HHSC uh, groundbreaking, which is moving along extremely rapidly in, in construction. The Lotus Behavioral Health Center grand opening, which um, provides uh, mental health crisis um, care for those in, in uh, South Placer. The Fruitvale School Museum grand opening, which will um, provide a, a third grade focused curriculum for uh, school visitors, focusing on the 1888 to 1946 history of uh, Fruitvale School when it functioned as a schoolhouse. Um, and then the Mercy at Rock Creek grand opening, 79 affordable apartments on the DeWitt campus. And then our tier one infrastructure construction award project, <clears throat> which uh, will replace water, uh, stormwater, and um, sewer lines throughout the, the DeWitt campus that have been in place for 80 plus years. So we, we've never been busier in facilities management it is absolute, when I was putting this together, it was really stunning that um, under construction right now, we have nearly $150 million worth of work, and that does not include the um, SB projects down at the jail who are about to begin construction. All in all, with our, our planning, our renovation, our rehabilitation projects, we are nearly at a quarter of a billion dollars worth of projects, which is mind boggling right now. So I'll go into all of these um, during the, the presentation, but I just wanted to, to kind of give that kind of uh, perspective of, of what's going on throughout the county. Some amazing projects that are, are um, greatly needed and greatly, greatly appreciated. <clears throat> so the question has come up, well, you know, why don't we do more of this work in-house? There's a tremendous amount of work that we do, and when we look at the, the structure of our capital improvements division, there's a tremendous number of architects, licensed architects that are on staff. And I don't know when the, the org chart was created and when these positions were put into place. It was long before my time. But I've learned over the years that it works extremely well from the perspective of variations in workload. When we have uh, less projects in place, we're able to, because we have architects who are educated, trained, experienced at, at doing projects, we're able to do some of those ourselves in-house. So we're not fluctuating our, our staff numbers, um, but we're, we're really kind of changing um, what roles are, are being played. So today, with the amount of work that we have underway now, we're able to manage a lot more work than we could ever do ourselves, um, and that is just because of the, the, uh, the talent that we, we have in place, um, that they're able to, to manage several projects with outside consultants um, who are um, you know, more equipped to, to do a greater amount of production for us. So, that's really an, uh, an explanation of, of uh, how we operate in the capital improvements division. Um, jumping into some of the projects, uh, the SB863 mental health facility, uh, this, this is a, just a, a fantastic opportunity to, to uh, give another tool in the sheriff's uh, tool belt for helping those who are involved in the, the justice system who uh, need housing programming and treatment space um, for mental health issues. And um, this is a, a project that will break ground uh, later in the spring of this year. And um, it is a project that we work jointly with at Senate Bill 863. So we work jointly with the state who are funding a portion of this project. And, one of the downsides of getting state money is that you are you know, tied to the, the hoops that they, they put before you and, and the time that it takes for them to review those and, and uh, so forth. So we, we worked very diligently to jump through all those hoops uh, and 
unfortunately, on the, the state side, their response time, changing in staff, other issues have just dragged the project on for more than six years. If you look at the timeline, project would have been built and in use for several years now if, uh, if it had moved along as it was in originally intended to move along. So the project was impacted by uh, the escalation, and unfortunately, this was a time of, of some significant construction escalation. On the flip side, we were fortunate that um, we were able to obtain funds through the American Rescue Plan Act, and I have for better clarification of, of the buckets of money that are contributing to this. While the state will provide $9.5 million for this, our general fund reserves will, will provide $4.3 million public safety fund, $3.8 million, and then $5 million from the American Rescue Plan Act. <clears throat> so we're excited for this project to begin construction. You can see in the site plan that it will be in the bottom right corner of the South Placer Adult Correctional Facility, um, which will, will uh, um, you know, really make for a, an appropriate location um, on the site for this facility to be placed. The next project, which is the SB 844 Vocational Center, um, this, this is another just tremendous opportunity to, to help those who, you know, unfortunately have, have maybe made some bad decisions to get them uh, trained with vocational behavior and life, life skills uh, training. So this will be a 120-bed facility. The mental health facility I didn't mention was a 45-bed facility. This is a 120-bed facility that will provide the training uh, needed. It will go to the east of the medium security facility shown by the star in this picture. And <clears throat> a more clarified breakdown of the, the costs here, 2.1 million will come from general fund reserves, 8.3 million from the public safety fund, and 3.1 million from the capital facility impact fees with uh, an anticipated 30 million um, coming from the state. The next project, this is the Clerk Recorder Elections Building, otherwise known as Atherton, because it's on Atherton in Rockland. And this is a photo I took last week. This is a picture of the lobby where the public will, will come when they have business to do at the, uh, the Clerk Recorder um, or Elections office there. And the, the picture is a nice picture, but it really doesn't do it justice. It is going to be beautiful. The, the wood uh, ceiling work, and you can see the louvers above the, uh, the overhang there, the, the light fixtures and all. It's really a very timeless, but a, a very attractive facility. So that one is nearing completion now. And um, it, it is a, a project that I know there's been a lot of interest in this project because of, of some of the costs that have, have come in. And you all approved um, the uh, change order this morning under consent. We, when we originally did our cost estimate, it was very accurate. And um, in fact, it was a little under our low bidder. And so we were able to add some scope to the project, some HVAC and, and roof replacement. And so uh, we, were, we were pleased with that. But um, this is a developer built building. Every building is unique. Developer-built buildings are often unique in unique ways. Um, sometimes uh, decisions are made that are, are maybe cost-saving at the time, uh, and then we don't, we don't discover them until later when we start doing a project and we uncover things that are sometimes shocking. So, so we were hit with, with some unknowns um, on this project that, that caused the, the cost to go up. We were also hit with the, the whole supply chain issue on this project that really impacted a lot of the electrical equipment um, on it. And with that extended uh, the construction period, which then added costs, of course. And I think, a, I think a lesson that we could learn from this and take away is that if, if we have the opportunity, if we have the time and the ability when we own a building, especially a building where we know it, it may, it may uh, have some, some, some surprises for us, we might want to do a little bit of destructive investigation, you know. If we know we want to do something that's going to be connected to a, a, a wall, we might open up that wall 
uh, ahead of actually doing the project just so that we can try to head those things off. Um, but other than that, um, it's going to be an absolutely beautiful uh, facility and it'll, it'll serve um, the CRE department for should be decades to come. Um, it will also uh, provide space in that building for the, the uh, assessor, which I'll, I'll get to in a, in a few moments. The Health and Human Services Center, which is under construction, that I, I know you all are all familiar with. And if you don't go by every day right now, <laughs> um, it is changing dramatically um, because they are moving so quickly. And this, when, when completed, of course, will consolidate um, a lot of the divisions uh, in Health and Human Services and provide just a, a magnificent facility for the public uh, to come to and, and uh, receive services from. It's a very flexibly designed building, lots of open space. Um, it's a rectilinear building, so laying out of furniture, et cetera, is, is uh, um, you know, very, very nicely done. The bottom left picture here is Dusty. Dusty is a little bit bigger than a Roomba. And what Dusty did was via Bluetooth and computer uh, communication, Dusty laid out all the walls. And so you can see some of the marks on the concrete underneath Dusty. And this was, this was really a, a, a first. I've never seen this done before. Um, but extremely successful, super accurate. It, it puts little marks on the floor. This is where your studs go. And this is where the drywall will be. And um, it, it uh, saves a tremendous amount of, of uh, time. And also, you know, once it's done, it can, you know, things could be checked um, just to make sure it's, it's done accurately. But um, okay, so Steve, can I just clarify? Yeah. So instead of a person doing that, the um, piece of equipment is programmed with the blueprints or the diagram or what have you and then right. it goes ahead and does what a person would ordinarily right. do it and do it a lot more precisely yes as far as measuring etc right so a person Your still is a, a person is still controlling you know dusty so it, it you know dusty doesn't work in the middle of the night or something like that when there's no one there it, it does require someone to uh, to um, you know, give it, give it direction, and then it does its thing. So anyway, I thought that was a pretty interesting uh, tidbit here. This view on the bottom right is looking east down the spine of the, the building. And starting at the top, you'll see the, the skylights that are north-facing skylights. And so this will just flood the, the center of the building with natural light. Um, you can see that in, inside the orange safety fencing, um, it, it's open to the first floor. So, and they, the architects calls, call this uh, collaboration street. So there's spots there where you can meet, sit down, talk with, with someone um, about things, and it just uh, offers a, a really inviting uh, space to, to communicate with each other and collaborate. So <clears throat> I have a few more pictures of this project because it's fascinating. On the left here is, is the crane that um, is installing some of the first panels. You can see the, the little yellow uh, guy there, uh, like a great all. Um, he's, he's helping position um, what the crane is supporting, which is one of these panels. On the picture on the right, you see the crane in the background, and it's picking up a panel off of a truck. And in the foreground is the next panel. So the panels are so big that only one panel per truck comes. So, uh, you know, there's this, this progression of, of delivery of panels as they're, they're needed. <clears throat> this is a, a, a picture that Eric Bergen took with the, his drone, and it shows those first panels um, going into position. You can see them down on the first floor there. And this is uh, above the Auburn Justice Center looking at the building um, from above Richardson. This, I put this picture in here. Again, Eric Bergen took this photo. This is just amazing how huge this crane is. And it's extremely expensive. <laughs> so it's thousands and thousands of dollars a day to use this crane. So they are moving as quickly as they can to put all of these panels into place and 
by the end of this week, the, the, the building will, will probably look like it's done from the outside, although it, they're just really getting into the work on the inside. This is a close-up view of some of the panels that were placed on the second floor. Um, they're concrete uh, with brick, and the windows are already installed. All this is done at the factory, which is um, Clark Pacific. They are magicians with concrete. They are the, the best in the, the area, if not the state. So the, the quality um, and the, the craftsmanship and the, the just the, the aesthetics are, are phenomenal um, for that. So please uh, drive by there whenever you can. I know that, that the roads are narrowed and that it's you know a little bit more difficult to get around. Oops. Um, next project is what we call our Tier 1 infrastructure project. Um, which is replacement of water, sewer, and stormwater uh, lines throughout the campus, the PCGC campus. Um, as I mentioned before, these are 80 plus year old lines that have been problematic. We, there's water leaks constantly on our campus that this will help remedy, which will save us uh, you know, money and of course save, save water that would otherwise just go away. Um, this project was a, a really successful collaboration between facilities management and the, the Department of Public Works who, who helped us and they worked hand in hand with us on, on some of the design decisions because there was a lot of challenges with the rock on our campus and potential for um, expense and unknowns again, which we want to try to avoid as much as possible. This project came in over our estimate by a, a good amount. And um, you know that was a um, oops, that was a, a concern of ours, and so we reached out to the the, the bidders and our successful contractor Doug Vierkamp, and um, learned that for one thing, when the bidding was taking place, the the whole supply chain escalation was a big concern to contractors because they would be ordering um, their their uh, product, all, all this piping. And they weren't. They didn't know what the cost would be when uh, they were going to order it. So uh, that was a, a challenge for them. But then we also found out that there were some some constraints that we put on them in their operations that also added to the cost of it. So we've met with um, Beer Camp staff, and and so far it's been extremely collaborative with them. And we're looking at changes and how uh, they can work running two crews, working longer hours, still within the, the uh, regulations for the county. Um, and we're looking at hundreds of thousands of dollars that we will receive back once we go through all of these opportunities for, for uh, cost savings. So, so that's the, the, the plus side, I think, on this project, the kind of the silver lining in it, as well as just the improvements to the, the utility infrastructure. The Tahoe Justice Center, um, which has, of course, long been uh, on the radar um, for the county. And the, the, the building itself, as, as many of us know, was built prior to the 1960 Winter Olympics. It was never built to be what it is utilized as today. And of course, over time, with uh, growth of the county, with changes in regulations, requirements, et cetera, uh, the, the building has, has reached um, and surpassed its useful life. Um, there's always been, a, I think, an assumption that we're going to build a new Tahoe Justice Center, and there was an assumption that it would probably be in some different location. So over the years, there's been locations considered, looked at, um, and uh, kind of test fit and, and so forth. But a few years ago, I had a meeting with all of the uh, departments and agencies that will be and are in the facility today. And overwhelmingly, all of them said, we would rather stay at this site. And so since then, we've done uh, a lot of work with uh, TRPA uh, to see if that's even possible, because the, the program for the new building is much larger, of course, um, than the existing building. The existing building, the, the county has about 9,200 square feet, and the courts have about 2,100 square feet. So it's about an 11,300 square foot building 
currently. The proposed project, the county has about 35,000 square feet and the courts about 15,000 square feet. So roughly 50,000 square feet, much, much larger. But in our kind of preliminary test fits, again, um, we're seeing that, that uh, this is quite feasible to go on the site. And, and we've worked out some site logistics so that, um, and working with the courts, we, we have a great relationship with, with them. Um, and they understand that their timeline may differ from ours. And theirs is typically going to be slower than our timeline. So we're looking at a, a potential solution that is two buildings connected um, probably with a, a bridge between the two so that in custodies can be taken over to court and so forth and staff could also uh, go from one building to the other. That would allow the county to, to move our project at, at the pace that, that works for us and it would allow the courts to move at their pace and what we would probably do if the county project comes first we would have a, a, a space that would accommodate the courts so they could just move 50 feet um, and come over and temporarily use a space within our building while the existing building is torn down and a new courts building is put into place. Then no, no one would leave the site at all um, and so there would not be the expense of remodeling some other facility somewhere for uh, use for a couple of years. Um, so we think that that solution, um, at least at this stage, is, is a, a real strong uh, possibility. And um, as we move forward with this year, um, we're going to focus on the environmental um, uh, review and uh, you know, public outreach and so forth that, that uh, the project requires. So, um, okay, moving on to Dollar Creek Crossing. Um, so this is a... a a project that the county is working with Related Pacific to plan achievable workforce housing um, with affordable rental apartments and for sale homes. And at this time, we're, we're working with Related Pacific to really narrow down the, the product type, quantities, size, configuration, et cetera, that could go on this site, as well as uh, working with TRPA and Caltrans um, to meet their requirements. So more to come on that project as, as uh, development is um, advancing. Okay, renovation projects that we do, these are projects that are requests from different departments based on their needs, either to improve efficiency, security, comfort, or a customer and employee experience. And we're allocated roughly one and a quarter million dollars a year to accomplish these projects. And I've listed some of the projects below. And um, we're in our world, we're so accustomed to, uh, on the DeWitt campus, the building numbers and not the address. And I know that the public and, and others don't know what these buildings are. So um, building 305 in the first line there, that's at 11471 F Avenue. Building 210 is at 2855 Second Street. And then building 306 is at 11477 E Avenue. And some of the uh, projects at the bottom, the ongoing renovations, uh, like our ADA improvements, those are things that we have a, a dollar amount that's, that's allocated. And throughout the year, we look at the highest priorities, the, the ones that impact uh, the public the most. It could be as simple as some signage changes to maintain um, our compliance, uh, handrails, et cetera. Um, so those, so I, didn't, I didn't list all of the, the projects. There's, there's um, several, but they, you know, um, they vary throughout the year as, as we uh, accomplish them and, and allocate the funds um, where the highest priorities are. Rehabilitation projects. These are projects that are really informed by our VFA software system, which is a system that uh, assessed all of our facilities and gives an estimated timeline for 
the need to replace them, whether it's a roof or HVAC system or, or uh, carpeting or what have you. So basically, it's a it's a system that that taps us on the shoulder and says, "Hey, you might want to check this." We then check it. Projects may uh, occur more quickly; they may occur later, or they may not occur at all, uh, depending on our, uh, how we assess them. So this is the the rundown of of where we are with this uh, past year's funding. 17% uh, are completed, 46% are in construction or bidding, and then 37% are in planning or design. And then down at the bottom here, 90% uh, of the FY21-22 projects are complete and the remainder are in planning, design, or construction. <clears throat> and those projects, I've got a couple of photos of some success stories. This is 1000 Sunset down in Rockland. Um, that HHS um, resides in there. This is a roof replacement. You can see the, the before picture at the top and then uh, the after picture below that. And uh, this, this project turned out very successfully and it, it will provide a, a uh, dry um, environment for 25 years uh, to come. So that's uh, the first project. And then this one, this is the the historic Auburn Courthouse and this is a roof replacement. I think when people think of the courthouse and you say roof replacement, I think people think of the dome it's, and it's not the dome, it's, it's the rest of the, the, the building. And um, the, what's noteworthy here is that it, it wasn't simply a, a roof replacement. We also replaced skylights, but then if you look in the after picture beyond the skylight, you see two flues coming up those, as well as some other architectural components, were rehabilitated um, or replaced in kind, and we used a, a historic uh, consultant to be in compliance with the Secretary of the Interior's um, guidelines for historic preservation. So that was a successful project. Another collaboration with the courts, because it was ongoing while there were court uh, operations going too. So, uh, very good, um, so, you know, story of communication and, and cooperation between the two agencies. Here's some projects that are in planning, and I often, I, you know, before I, I had not necessarily included a lot of the planning projects in this presentation simply because some of them were just not far along, whether it was budget, scope, or both. But I thought I'd bring these forward to you. The assessor um, here, this is a photo of Atherton um, today, how it looks with the, the remodel. The sign is, is already there on the building. Um, the assessor will move out of, of uh, what we call Building B, which is the building next to the Santucci um, Courthouse. And um, they'll move into uh, the upper floor of, of the uh, Atherton building. Next to that is the district attorney, and by the assessor moving out of this building B, where the, the DA also resides, it gives them an opportunity to uh, expand their, their needs, um, and including their um, MDIC, their multidisciplinary interview center, which is another very valuable resource that, that we provide. It is focused on uh, children who are victims of abuse and it creates an environment for them to, to talk with uh, you know, a forensic interviewer um, to find out um, from their perspective just, just what's going on uh, potentially. So that, that's you know, going to be uh, another great tool for, for our DA to use. Bottom left, the HHS Adult System of Care Crisis Center. Um, our HHS team is very resourceful at going out and getting grants, finding uh, monies and opportunities. And so this, this is one where they have received a grant and then they're waiting to hear, I believe, on the other grant. But there's two wings at the DeWitt Center um, adjacent to the chapel, so in between B and C Avenue, that um, with uh, remodel um, that would, would take place, it would provide um, some mental health care for those who are having crisis um, issues uh, at the time. So again, another, another strong um, 
just offering to our, our community. Next to that, the PCGC warehouse and mobile command vehicle enclosure. Uh, if you've ever seen the mobile command vehicle, it's, it's huge and it is extremely expensive and uh, it doesn't need to sit in the weather <laughs> for the amount of money that it costs. So this warehouse that we're planning, which is just to the north of the juvenile hall um, on B Avenue. So if you're going down B towards the Animal Services Center, it would be on your left before you get to the Animal Center. Um, so um, that would provide warehousing space for any department, um, you know, from in the county. And it would also provide this kind of multi-use space for the sheriff's office. They could store the uh, vehicle there. They can then also pull it out and do some um, training with their staff, whether it's close quarters, combat type uh, work, that sort of thing that, that uh, in a, a much safer environment than, than they've had in the past. Next to that, um, the waterfall and avalanche of moves uh, that we've named them. The waterfall being down here, uh, and, and that is triggered by the new HHS building as well as uh, Atherton. So with the new HHS building and um, Atherton being completed, there will be people moving out of uh, the CDRC building as well as the finance and administration building and some other um, wings and uh, rented leased space. Um, so that then gives us the opportunity to backfill those spaces with other departments or divisions to create better consolidation um, and be as efficient as we can with the resources we already have. The, the new um, HHS building will be a zero net energy building, meaning that the solar panels in its parking lot will produce as much electricity over the course of a year as the building will use in that same time frame. So <clears throat> we already are paying the utilities for the CDRC and the FAB. Um, so we're going to move uh, people into those, those spaces. And then the, the avalanche, which is up in the Tahoe area, the, hence the snow reference, um, is a similar um, exercise where, where we're trying to, to find um, what's, what's the, the best location the, that accommodates future growth, um, what are the facilities that we have now, what do we need to do to, to improve that and, and set us on a course for decades to come. Both of these projects will initially be informed um, through a uh, contract that, that the CEO's office is, has uh, issued that um, is, is a, a firm that will help us with projections, staffing projections for um, decades to come. That along with uh, interviews that we have held with, with staff as well. Then this last slide here called unresolved projects, which for lack of a better term is, is just uh, things that we, we want on your radar um, because they are uh, potentially coming forward. The first one, an administration building. As, as we know, we completed a um, master plan at the PCGC campus. In that master plan, there was a proposed a new administration building which would replace the domes and the domes annex. Um, but it was not a, in an early phase of that master plan implementation. There have been a lot of things that have occurred, uh, you know, issues with this building itself, um, as well as, as uh, just, I think, a, a kind of a, a built-up frustration with a lot of the, the, the uh, um, issues that, that occur here at, at this building. So that's something that we want you all to consider as we look forward. Is this, is this something that we want to, to move ahead, move it um, further along sooner. Um, to the right of that, the DeWitt Theater. Um, as you're aware, the um, DeWitt Community Complex Group has a desire to, to save and renovate and expand on the existing theater. And um, your board uh, gave them a, an extended timeline to, to do such. And they have uh, they've developed a, a plan for what they would like to do. Um, complete with cost estimate, and then um, also an operations plan. 
um, for how they would operate the theater, and I know that they would like to come before the board and present that for consideration. Um, bottom left, library grant. This, this is a photo of a study room that was recently completed at the Auburn Library. It's beautiful um, space there, very flexible space for them. So Mary George has um, been successful in receiving a grant for $4.9 million for the Auburn Library for some infrastructure improvements. It's a matching grant that would require the county to provide an equal uh, match. She's also um, looking at pursuing a, a grant for the Kings Beach Library. Um, so that, that is to come uh, in the future. We'll get news on that and, and see what, what that will lead us uh, down towards. Um, bottom right, the Cincinnati Solar. The property that the county has um, near Rockland and Roseville on Cincinnati Avenue um, is currently a, a um, vacant lot basically, and uh, it's a, a depressed area, um, and, would re and if we were to develop something on it, would require a tremendous amount of money to fill it to get high enough. Um, so we were looking at it as an opportunity for a uh, solar, a ground-mounted solar field that doesn't, doesn't matter if the, if, if the uh, ground level is, is low. And this would be through a, a program that PG&E has, however, it is nearing its capacity. So this is an issue of, of time is of the essence. It would allow us to put a very large array down there that we could then say the electricity generated there can go to this address, that address, that address to offset the use of those locations and um, get the entire county much, much closer to a zero net energy. And with the escalation of PG&E rates and everyone's rates, you know, Roseville's also going up, um, you know, the, the savings here on this site would be in the tens of millions of dollars over the life of the, the uh, um, panels. With that, I've spoken enough. So if there are questions, I'm happy to take them now. I'll start off. Well, okay. first of all, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, you and your team are very busy, and we have a lot going on, and we're fortunate that we actually are able to do all this work. Uh, so I, I really appreciate the update. I, ha I have a question for you. Um, you know, we had an opportunity to go out to Burton Creek a couple of weeks ago yes. and see the site, and you know, that location was built 60 years ago and very temporary, right? And it is cramped and it is terrible. Um, as everyone acknowledges and has for a very long time. I think that was even part of the grand jury yes. report follow-up that <laughs> when are you going to replace Burton Creek? So it's terrific to see us moving forward. And, you know, as I think about it, right, it's a $50 million proposal and there'll be some dollars offset for the courts with through the probably the state of California, right? Um, but it's a very small footprint now. Um, and definitely too small, so I acknowledge that. Um, but looking at the increase in size, it's more than a four time increase in size. And, and I, I look at it and I go, it's a big cost. Is there a way to scale it down? Um, because do we need that big of a, a location um, when we're trying to watch our dollars? And I certainly want our folks up there to have a much better facility, right? You can you can hardly walk by somebody in the hallways. It's mm -hmm. it's so tight and it's like a maze. So I don't want anybody to think I don't want to see a change there. We definitely need it. But when you look at the size increasing by um, <clears throat> four four times, more than four right. times, and especially the court. So that was which was really interesting. Going from right. twenty one hundred square feet to 15,000 square feet, are they gonna fund that whole portion? Because that, that's a huge amount, right? Yes. And we're talking one court room. One court room. With offices, of course, and we have the DAs that Correct. are up there. So I understand that. And of course, that courtroom now is not even enough for the jurors. 
But that's a huge increase. And is the state going to pay for that amount? I mean, if they're going right. to pay for that fully, well, yes. okay. But that's a huge increase. In yes, price. it is. And, and yes, that is, that is the plan. And um, their, uh, their facility, um, you know, of course, is growing by many, many times that. They have a challenge, though, with the state because it is a single courtroom. And the state will look at that and say, do we want to put this amount of money into a single courtroom that has a relatively you know, low use rate? That's, and that's their, that's their challenge to, to face. But yes, that is, that is the plan, that they would fund um, all of, of their project, as well as a shared um, work, because there would be shared parking, there would be shared infrastructure, and so forth. Um, so we would be working jointly with them. If our project moves forward and theirs doesn't move forward, they would stay where they are in the existing building. So we could have our building in place and then the existing building would stay there until the state decides that, yes, now's the time we're going to replace that. Is there, oh. a, is there an opportunity perhaps to partner with like Nevada County uh, for the That's courts because right I get that one courtroom is not <clears throat> that large but is have we had those conversations or have the courts had the conversations about partnering with Nevada County we currently partner with them just for um, the housing the jail of, yes exactly mm -hmm. um, I don't know um, what the status of of those conversations are. However, I do know that the the process that the state goes through in prioritizing these these court facilities has brought this location up to within a you know funding in the near future. Um, mm -hmm. So they go through their their analysis. It's you know doesn't mean that it's a sure thing, but um, they have have done a, a needs analysis and a, a prioritization with uh, all of the factors that they consider and, and it's moved up um, you know into you know one of the top teens I, I was just going to follow up um, that you know we're shrinking pop full-time population up there and so if you think of the county wide I think we have 12,000 residents mm -hmm. And if you think about trying to build this sort of facility for every 12,000 residents we have in our county, yeah. we would, would never bang. go there, right? And so I do think um, maybe we need to talk with our courts and see um, what we can do uh, to partner because the town of Truckee, I think, is about, I want to say about 20,000 people. Now that starts to maybe make and it isn't so hard for any of us to drive just like we would ask Forest Hill people to come down to go to court in Auburn right. or in South Placer that we mm -hmm. could ask people to drive to Truckee for, for jury and in court. But I know that we put on our boundaries in government so much and hold on to those so tightly it doesn't make sense to the taxpayers. And I think we need to save money wherever yeah. we can. So I, I agree with that concept that they definitely need a new facility but how big and how much are the assumptions in it so yeah can are you done or did you um, more because I had a question too go ahead I'll see if I, have I, I think my overall question Steve is I so appreciate what your staff are doing with this mammoth list of projects from my background and in, in my experience you sometimes need somebody outside of direct management of those projects to ask tough questions on those assumptions to save money for the taxpayers and the buck stops up here with us when we're allocating the general fund dollars to match these projects so I want to understand what your process is to really second-guess assumptions I know staff you know whether they're in a library or in a jail or in a courthouse or in a health and human services office want space but yes. space costs a lot of money and we should be getting more efficient and effective with digital records with digital everything remote access so I just want to make sure we're giving you the tools you need to have really objective outside thoughts 
before we spend that money because when it gets up here then we look like we're not supporting we want to support right. but we have limits too and if we spend all that money on that facility there isn't money for the next need in the county right and that's that's the tough part for me I just have that background to say it all starts with the assumptions mm -hmm. that you use going in mm -hmm. and everything builds on that and by the time it gets to the board we're asked to approve plans and specs where assumptions were made way back then if we start over now it's a time we're gonna lose the grant we're gonna you know jeopardize funding right and now we're the bad guys and and I know <clears throat> that's what we get paid the big bucks for but <laughs> at times you know I want to I want to have those assumptions um, thought through at the very beginning yes. before it gets to us and as as an example of that the, the HHS building huge building mm -hmm. 147,000 square feet we went through an exercise with their staff because like you said with the boundaries of, of government we have boundaries of departments as well and um, so one of the things that we um, we stressed and it reduced the overall program for that building is meeting spaces so divisions would say yeah I need this I need this many meeting rooms well we looked at it and we worked with them and cut down the number of meeting spaces in that building dramatically because they can be shared and then on a larger scale we um, and we were able to afford that conference center there we looked at that as hey this is a county-wide resource that you know is not just an, an HHS uh, building resource and so with that um, other meeting spaces that that uh, you know programs may call for we look at that building and say, hey, look, we can use that. And, and we um, plan to have a, an implemented means of reserving meeting spaces in other buildings other than your own, you know, electronically, um, so that can be done as well. And we had a conversation the other day um, about that outside set of eyes looking at things. And um, one thing that, that we would like to to implement, and you know, when I was in the private sector, we did this a lot, is um, just review of drawings um, at you know, the different stages of development um, for those types of issues, both quality control and, and so forth, but also what are other ways that we can do things to, to save money. The, the tier one infrastructure project, we, we um, you know, were able to do some savings by using a a, um, I think it's a HD90, it's more like a plastic pipe versus like a cast iron pipe. And that, that was a, a less expensive and still approved by PCWA and NID. Um, so that was a, a savings. And working with the contractor on, hey, how can you do your job more efficiently? Let us know and we can, we can work those savings out. And so that's what, you know, what I commented about the several hundred thousand dollars coming forth. But I, yeah, wholeheartedly agree with that and, and whatever we can do to make things as efficient as, as possible and, and utilize, you know, um, things that sit vacant, you know, are, are costly and, and um, not efficient. So, yeah, I appreciate that comment. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that. You're up. I appreciate your team's efforts. You have a lot on your plate. And like I said, sometimes for you, the departments are saying, here's what we need. And it's those assumptions yes. that start the groundwork, the foundation for a project that then comes in at potentially many millions of dollars more than maybe would have been had different assumptions been. Yes. It's like, I would like to have a bigger house. Can you? <laughs> but what can I afford? Right. So I start at a different assumption level, right? Right. <laughs> I have actually a follow-up, and, and so thank you. And, and to Supervisor Gustafson's point, um, I serve on CSAC, California State Association mm -hmm. of Counties, and so I've gotten to know some of the organizations that help support counties, whether that's software, um, construction projects, privatization of services. There are two companies, um, Vanner, yep. and then I think the other one, I think it's DRE, I have to go back and look. The gentleman emailed me just, I think, last week. So there are a couple of organizations that can come along counties that have consulting for contract 
mm -hmm. for big, large contracts or construction projects. <clears throat> I want to encourage us where it makes sense to consider, you know, you've got so much on your plate. Mm -hmm. You know, can we utilize an outside company um, to help us do the work we need to do at a reduced cost in some way or to be more effective? So I, right. I think it's worth looking at these organizations um, and I can forward to you and uh, to Jane the, the names of the folks because it may make sense. It may right. not, but I think it's worth us looking at organizations that are private that can help partner with us to help us be more efficient in how we spend our dollars. And we, and Vanner was integral in the development of SB 863 and 844 as we were working through the state's requirements to get the projects out on the street and one of the things that we do for larger or more complex projects is we utilize design build mm -hmm. and I am a proponent of it and was involved many 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 years ago when initial uh, legislation for schools was was um, put forth but when we when we utilize design build it gives us a, a much better um, ability to choose a team that one, the architect and contractor want to work together, because that can be uh, contentious, you know, and two, we want to work with them and collaborate with them. So because of that, um, the morgue project, one of the most technically complex buildings within our entire portfolio, was done with design build. And what we have typically done when we do design build, like with the HHS building, and we have a good team on board, we don't hire an outside consultant. They're extremely expensive on the order of five to eight percent of the construction cost for a construction manager to be on board. So um, we were successful with the morgue, we're, we're being successful with the HHS building. Um, and we'll continue to, to, to try to do that in the most efficient way possible. Like with the SB projects, um, we have um, a, uh, an individual who is basically kind of sort of our construction manager, and he worked at the jail down there throughout its construction and operation, and so he's our, our sounding board and our expert um, for, you know, way less than if we were to hire a so can I follow up on that? Yeah. So uh, companies like Vanner or mm -hmm. I don't know, DWE or whatever it is, I'll yeah. have to check. Um, would they would their utilizing them likely increase our costs by five to eight percent? Yes. You think? Okay. Dur yes. And During, it's different. We're an organization that actually has a lot of resources. A smaller county exactly. may need something. They absolutely. Happen. That's exactly what it what it's about. And. Our Animal Services Center was a, a huge success. It was a design build contract, but we also had a construction manager on board. And looking back at that, that was right when I was joining the county and I looked at that and I thought, wow, that, you know, we spent a lot of money on that. Very successful project. Um, but moving forward, I was looking towards being as efficient as we can be and not utilizing a construction manager um, when we're utilizing a design build delivery. They are, they're an excellent resource for many things, whether it's you know, developing our SB projects or quality control review of, of um, documents. Um, and then like you said, uh, counties that have fewer resources on staff, um, they're, they're definitely a, a benefit to those because you know, they're they're talented experts, so. Thank you. Jean, you had a comment? You're, I think you're Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, just um, on point with Supervisor Gore and Gustafson's comments, um, as Steve pointed out, when we last met with departments on the waterfall of moves in December of 2022, Departments themselves identified the need for a common set of assumptions to guide how we're going to grow so that before we start this domino of moves that we're doing it with not just what we know today, but with how we anticipate growing with certainly this considerable growth and development we're seeing in West Placer. 
uh, Deputy Shauna Pervines is actually working with EPS out of the Bay Area that actually did this work for my prior agency in the 90s to help inform how we're going to grow relative to our community and in the context of what's happening today with remote work changing service models so that we will not start this waterfall of moves until we have that common set of assumptions for how we're going to do so responsibly. On the Eastern Placer Fund, uh, both uh, Chana Pervines and Stephanie Holloway and I met with the Nevada County CEO and the Town of Truckee manager uh, on January 23rd before our Tahoe board meeting to talk about working together. We're already partnering with them on HHS, on probation, on animal services, potentially on libraries, and identifying other areas, perhaps such as justice, that we could partner on going forward. And as luck would have it, I have a meeting scheduled with the courts tomorrow afternoon so we can start that conversation. Great. Oh, good. Thank you, Jean. <clears throat> Any other comments uh, from board members? Yes, yeah, so uh, it's amazing how much we're getting done. We don't realize that until you start writing it all down. Right. <laughs> I drive by the uh, HHS building every day, twice, at least twice, and I just, just see the changes gradually, the changing landscape. When did we anticipate that being finished? The HHS building should be completed, and we should be moving in uh, around the end of the calendar year. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So I know we have uh, we're running space uh, over by the library or by the uh, post office and yes. Department of Motor Vehicles for right. Children's System of Care. Right. Is that a lease, a long-term lease? That is. And Correct. so, is it going to be commensurate of ending that when? The move is taken care of? Yeah, I think our lease goes a little bit longer than that um, on that property, but gives us the flexibility to, to you know, move out um, when it's most appropriate. In other words, we're not having to move out, you know, prior to yeah. or, or enter into a, yeah. you know, lengthy lease that we would be paying for without being there. Would there be any uh, consideration of maybe keeping that lease for a, um, department that needed some more space right now uh, we can we can look at that I I um, I'm very hesitant to to ever ask those questions because it's like oh do you need more storage space a absolutely I need more storage space and so you know instead of thinning things down we get more things so um, but yeah we, we can look at that and see if that's a, a cost-effective um, Alternatives. I, I think it would be appropriate to do that okay. uh, yes, for uh, a particular uh, department that needed uh, a, a better, uh, just a better facility, mm -hmm. if you put it that way. All right. Okay. okay. We'll do. Right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. As, wait, is there any public comment? Oh. Kind of don't, don't leave yet. Mr. Garabedian, hello. Yeah, Mike Garabedian, hello. I haven't been to, heard one of these discussions for a while, so I really don't know all the background here, but uh, I wanted to bring up a couple. Oh, first, first of all, one of those projects looks like a classic wooey project, locating a building in a forest up at North Tahoe. Uh, but, um, you know, it's not safe to build in the forest anymore. Um, so uh, I guess my main observation or question is about uh, it, it, at least walking in here and sitting in the back, I don't hear any discussion of uh, development to serve uh, county facilities to serve West County. I don't know when that's going to happen. I see there's catch up trying to get, I guess, sheriff services there. Hear, hear that at one meeting. Uh, I mean, it, the impression I have, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that developers get to build wherever they want, and the county kind of later tries to figure out how to get the roads built and how to get the facilities there. And that kind of thing. So I'm just wondering, when, when, and where that, uh, when, when are we thinking ahead? So we're not playing catch up. If maybe we're not playing catch up. But so yeah, that's that's really my b basic question is, uh, what about you've talked about a couple areas of the county and here, and uh, what about uh, building needs in the rest of the county? What are the plans for that, and when, and stuff like that? And maybe that's not an easy answer. Well, we just did the coroner's facility last year. 
Sorry. Uh, we're also in planning to do a uh, uh, for the uh, Auburn or the Plas Santucci Justice Center a vocational uh, housing for some of the inmates that need training, and we also have a mental mental facility proposed that it was on on the uh, schedule. It was on the the the, uh, pro the pilot. The, What's PowerPoint. the PowerPoint? That's it. It was on yeah, there. Yeah, the so, elections building uh, is down the there. The elections building uh, down there. So we've got a lot of projects in the western to serve our residents in the western. Oh, I see what you mean. The people yeah. go go yeah. to that area from right. way out there near Sutter right. County. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Anybody online? I see online. Too. All right. Thank you, Steve, so much. That's a very uh, informative uh, presentation. So now we're moving to uh, the, oh, that's, no, it's not one o'clock, is it? 8A. <laughs> uh, we're moving to 8A, the Community Development Resource Agency Placer Conservation Program Endowment Fund Transfer. Good morning, Mr. McKenzie. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, ladies and gentlemen, uh, happy Valentine's Day. Uh, happy to be here this morning with the Placer Conservation Program's Endowment Fund Transfer. This has been a, quite a process, about two years worth of RFPs, working with uh, County Council, um, outside council, the treasurer, the auditor's office, your CEO, budget finance team to get us to a point where we can move the transfer forward. Uh, so I will walk you through the actions requested, a little bit of background, and then bring it back to you for questions and public comment. So the uh, actions requested are to approve and authorize the transfer of approximately $775,000 and some change from the uh, Placer Conservation Authority's endowment funds held in the county treasury uh, over to the community and agency support fund, which will then be distributed to our successful RFP uh, awarded contractor, if you will, the Placer Community Foundation. Um, also asking for approval of a budget amendment in the current budget year uh, for the CEDRA budget, since this item will need to be included in as part of the budget, uh, to approve the transfer of the endowment funds to the Placer Community Foundation in accordance with the endowment agreement on an ongoing basis as requested by the Placer Conservation Authority. And then finally, to determine the action is not a project pursuant to the California Environmental Equality Act because it is an administrative and fiscal action. So the Placer Conservation Authority was formed uh, with the advent of the PCCP, Placer County Conservation Program. Uh, it has since been in operation for approximately the past two years. Uh, it is a joint power agency formed between the city of Lincoln and the county in partnership with the Placer Conservation, or, sorry, <laughs> Placer County Water Agency and the South Placer Regional Transportation Authority. Uh, the PCA, Placer Conservation Authority's responsibilities include, amongst a lot of other things, establishing an endowment fund and ensuring that that fund meets the long-term funding requirements for the reserve system. The endowment fund was established in the county treasury concurrent with the adoption of the PCP. The endowment is funded by an earmark out of every land conversion fee dollar collected of 7%. That rate can be adjusted over time, but currently set at 7% of every land conversion fee dollar that comes in earmarked into that holding account, if you will, in county treasury, and then it will be in the future with your approval transferred over to the Placer Community Foundation for their management. So on November 30th of last year, the PCA board met and approved uh, and awarded the endowment agreement to and with the Placer Community Foundation. They were the successful uh, bidder, if you will, uh, proposer in that case, the PCA board uh, saw fit to approve an endowment agreement and that agreement was really what took all of the time and effort between the treasurer, the auditor, 
county council, outside council, and myself to get it to this point. So that was approved last November by the PCA board. Uh, going forward, your action today will be the transfer of endowment of funds in accordance with the PCP's implementing agreement uh, and section eight disbursements and deposits of the HCP and CCP fees of the joint exercise powers agreement between the county and the city of Lincoln, which established the PCA. So with that, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those. Uh, this will come to the conclusion of a lot of planning in order to make sure our endowment funds are managed and invested uh, for the next 50 years before it's a non-wasting endowment account. They will be deposited with the community foundation not to be touched until the end of the PCP permit terms 50 years from now. Okay. So growing fund. Okay. Uh, Supervisor Gustin, you ready? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. That was left on from before. Oh, okay. All right. Any other comments from uh, board members? I see none. Uh, any comment from the public? Sure. Hello again. Uh, good morning. Mike Caravedian, Placer Conservation, uh, Placer County tomorrow and Pacific to American Divide. Uh, so uh, I spent four and a half years reviewing ag conservation easements funded by the state and so forth and working on that process. I went to four land trust alliance meetings around the country, including Sacramento, and I worked the state constitutional provision that makes uh, conservation easements and Williamson Act and uh, TPZ a constitutional issue. And um, so <laughs> we, uh, before 10 years ago, a community foundation was not allowed to be involved in this kind of role in conservation easements. It took SB 1094 to allow that to happen. There are very good reasons for that because the normal conservation uh, process of uh, enforcing, monitoring, uh, do, and building the in, it, endowment is one, pro, one in conservation easement or one conservation project funding by one by one. I don't see this kind of experience on the board of the Conservation Foundation, all the wonderful stuff they do. So I think this needs a much more careful analysis before, before this goes ahead. I know you've done a lot, a lot of work on it. Um, but, uh, you know, just like today, there's not much public, you know, wait all day for this PCCP item to get, it's not a special timed item, and everybody says there's been public involvement with this, which I just totally disagree with. There has been, almost nobody knows what the PCCP is, and they're not going to find out. The person from, on the, the advisor on the PCCP from Lincoln, at the beginning, he said, we have to inform the public, and later he said that the myth that the public had plenty of involvement with this for all, all those years. So, uh, some, just some bullets. Um, the, uh, the, the advisory committee does not have county council at its meetings, and you basically have Loduca on it, making, uh, con making le legal, what I would call legal pronouncements, and the Taylor Morrison person doing the same thing, making legal pronouncements without, without county council at the advisory committee. Um, now, most of what the PCA does is secret from the public. You know, Greg McKenzie does his work. He passes it on to the county. And um, wh what they're doing in those meetings or the, 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 the federal meetings called by the Army Corps, they have uh, the people there from the different agencies. They decide what to do. And then it just gets rubber stamped, both by the regional water board. Uh, anyway, a, a, ser a serious pro uh, problem on that score. Um, the, the California law, the Natural Communities Conservation Law, is much stronger than the federal law. It requires landscape level ecosystem protection. We have, Mr. Mr. McKenzie, overseeing landscape level ecosystem destruction. Um, now, uh, the, um, I would recommend that you take it off the calendar. I don't think there's the slightest chance that's going to happen. But I think you need to know, you need to know what your future opponents are going to be, you know, saying, why did you do this? Why did you, why is this happening? You know, that's what you're going to get, or somebody's going to get, when they're trying to figure out what's going on out there. So uh, th there are really serious problems with this, and serious problems with the, the, what the people understand about what's happening, and what's going to go on out there. And this, this is the, uh, the wrong way to do it, you know, to have the, the, uh, the process of doing the, the, uh, fu the funding, the, the endowment, handled separate from someone some, with a group that doesn't know anything or have anyone on the board at least. Uh, you know, maybe there's some, something uh, that allows them to bring that kind of expertise to bear. I, I think it's an experiment 
and one that is has serious serious problems. And and looking, reading quickly through the uh, the agreement, uh, you know, who were who were those two members of the Placer County Advisory Committee? Who were the two members that met in those meetings? That's critical to know. You know, was it Marcus and, and Kirk or what? Who was it? Who who got to rep represent the Placer Advisory Group Committee? Thank you. Major questions. I'm glad to have an opportunity to say something. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the public? Uh, I, I just have a question. Can you explain to me the role of the Placer Community Foundation in this proceeding? Certainly. Uh, so, as I mentioned last November, the PCA board met to review the proposal from the Placer Community Foundation. There are three types of organizations that are allowed to hold conservation endowments in the state of California. One being community foundations with experience. Two being a congressionally chartered foundation. There's one that I'm aware of, it's the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. And then the third would be under the treasury for which the funds were collected, which happens to be the county treasury where the funds are currently held. Uh, the PCA board met, uh, reviewed the qualifications of the Placer Community Foundation. They do actually hold the Natural Wonders Forever Fund for the Placer Land Trust, which are conservation funds for very similar properties that the PCA will hold and manage under conservation easements and fee title ownership. Uh, so that's really the relationship. It's nice that we had a local entity uh, that we know the board members, we can meet with regularly. The endowment agreement actually allows for one appointee of the PCA board to serve on the uh, finance committee. Uh, it has to be a minority membership, but somebody who can sit on their finance and investment committee to help them uh, in, in the transactions that we'll have with the uh, county treasury as well as managing those funds in perpetuity. Uh, happy to address any other questions you might have relative to the public comment. Yeah, I, I have no, no objection. I, I know they do a really good job. I just kind of needed to understand that a little more. Uh, Supervisor Jones, you have a comment. Yeah, I was just curious. Um, can we know who those two members of the um, our advisory board were on? Most definitely, and they happen to both come from your district, uh, one being Jeff Small, who's an uh, attorney and, and finance uh, a uh, consultant, I guess I would call him, uh, and then Amber Beckler being the second member. We also had a third member being Supervisor Wygant, who served on the uh, Endowment Review Committee and met with the uh, uh, Plastic Community Foundation. Good. Okay, that, that you, helps me quite a bit. Thank you. Did you mean retired Supervisor Wygant? Yes. Okay, thank you. I say former? Sorry. Swinger. Just former take, taking care of Supervisor Landon here. <laughs> uh, Supervisor Gore. Uh, thank you, Greg, and I appreciate Mr. Garabedian's comments. Uh, just one item, which was the concern about county council not being at the advisory committee, but any of the work that comes from the advisory committee um, comes before the board of super, or the the board of the PCA, um, and then of course all those items are vetted with our county council, which is Clayton Cook. Um, so I just want to make sure folks know that we're not doing things um, without. Um, input from our county council, making sure it's done appropriately. This is way too important. These dollars are too large for us to um, not be really responsible with how we're going to plan for the future in the next 50 years to make sure that these lands are kept um, the way they are supposed to be when we conserve them. So I uh, just want to clarify that. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Landon. I was going to say the same thing as Supervisor Gore, so I don't need to say that. So with that, I would like to move approval. Do I need to read these, or is it okay since Greg read them? Okay. Supervisor Gustafson, you had a comment? I will second, and then my point of discussion was just to say again that I think the Placer Community Foundation is doing an outstanding job. I know they manage quite a few reserves and endowment funds. Um, and are very knowledgeable meeting with their board members. I'm so impressed with obviously not only how astute they are in creating the foundation and managing those endowment funds, but in addition, um, just the incredible generosity of having Placer County residents and businesses supporting 
so many emergency situations we faced in our county. Um, and I just hats off that they were the ones who, who proposed on this. I like the termination clause. That was my only question. Reread it this morning and felt very comfortable that if anything ever happened to them, the endowment goes back to PCA and then we can rediscuss. So um, I think that's a good, good call on that. Thank you, Greg. Actually, I might just clarify. Um, that provision does not allow it to come back to the PCA. It allows it only to go to another qualified Another entity. qualified, yes. <laughs> Sorry. But it goes, but they've already taken that into consideration that if sometime in the future, well, none of us know what will happen 30, 40, 50 years from now. So All the eventualities we had to think yes. through. Yes, I appreciated that. Thank you. Supervisor Landon, did you have another comment? No. Uh, so the action requested was gratefully read into the record by Mr. McKenzie. So um, this is a roll, uh, yeah. yeah, it's mm -hmm. a real roll call vote. So it's been moved and moved by Supervisor Landon and seconded by Supervisor Gustafson. Will the clerk please call the roll? Jones, aye. Gustafson, aye. Gore, aye. Landon, yes. Holmes, yes. Thank you. Now we'll move to uh, item nine, Health and Human Services Psychiatric Hospital Umbrella Agreements. Pardon? Oh, hi, Amy. Hi, uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Holmes and members of the board. I am Amy Ellis um, with the Adult System of Care here to request two action items today. The first is to approve an increase of $1.5 million for a new maximum aggregate amount of $3.6 million for existing psychiatric hospital umbrella agreements with an existing term ending June 30th, 2023. The second is to approve a fiscal year 22-23 budget amendment uh, with the adult system of care in the amount of $500,000. So the adult and children's system of care continue to provide mandated mental health crisis services to residents of Placer County. Um, during our fiscal year 21-22, the adult system of care and children's system of care served 3,505 residents experiencing a crisis with just under 50% of those individuals receiving a crisis evaluation who required further inpatient psychiatric treatment. We use a variety of different hospitals in order to, um, to make the necessary placements. Um, these ones within this contract are private hospitals and they provide necessary psychiatric hospital um, stabilization for children, youth, and adults. Um, despite the systems of care continuing to enter contracts with what are called psychiatric health facilities that are able to draw down some um, additional state funding, the utilization of these freestanding psychiatric hospitals represented in this umbrella has continued to rise during the last several years with increased admissions about 15.8% in 2021 increased lengths of stay year over year by about 16.6% in 2021, and um, rising contracted rates, which have gone up by about 16%. All of these reasons combining with this needed amendment today. So the fiscal is impact of this is the total cost of um, $1.5 million, with 500,000 of that being um, a budget amendment with adult system of care. Uh, but there are no additional impacts to our general fund. Um, and I would uh, entertain any questions about this amendment. Thank you. Oh, yeah. uh, thank you, Amy. I've got a couple of questions. Um, we're, you're, this, is, these, this funding is gonna go to the inpatient psychiatric, psychiatric hospitals, correct? Yeah, it's an umbrella contract that um, includes about six separate locations okay. where we make placements. So is are they the same as a psychiatric health facility? No, a psychiatric health facility is um, covered by the IMD exclusion, which means they have to remain under 16 beds okay. in order to receive federal and state offsetting funds. So we did in, um, in, increase our contracts with psychiatric health facilities and are actually 
currently trying to add another one to um, to Placer County, just given the increase of need here. I hope to be able to do that in the future because they are a really cost effective way. But sometimes when all even with those increase of contracts and being able to utilize those POFs as to the maximum of our ability, we do need to place at these private freestanding hospitals that, that don't draw down that same type of revenue from the federal and state. Okay. And so how many psychiatric health facilities do we have in Placer County? You know offhand? Uh, no. Well, I know that this umbrella that you're uh, going forward today is um, is the six locations um, that are listed. But then, in addition, we have some separate contracts. I, you know, I don't know the exact number offhand. So these are contracts with some uh, uh, nonprofits providers. Uh, no, they're they're usually for profit. Actually, these these hospitals that are freestanding hospitals. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any questions from the other board members? I see none. Is there anybody in the audience wishes to address this item? Anyone online? I see no. Well, again, the action requested has been uh, read into the record by Amy Ellis, so I will entertain a motion. I'll second. Okay. Okay, so motion to approve by Supervisor Jones, second by Supervisor Gore. Will the clerk please call the roll? Gustafson? Aye. Gore? Aye. Landon? Yes. Jones? Aye. Holmes? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Amy. Now we'll move to item 10. This is uh, human resources, salary adjustment for the Board of Supervisors and Sheriff Coroner Marshall. Kate Sampson. With your Human Resources Department. I have the pleasure of being here this morning requesting your consideration of the introduction of two uncodified ordinances related to salary adjustments. The first relates to the Placer County Charter, Section 207, which was effective January of 2015. Uh, and was approved, it was an amendment to the charter approved by the Placer County voters regarding the salaries for the Board of Supervisors. The charter um, now requires that the county uh, establish the average salary of the Board of Supervisors for the counties of El Dorado, Nevada, and Sacramento, and then sets the uh, salary for your Board of Supervisors at that amount. In applying the formula this year, uh, the salary is recommended to be adjusted by 9.18%. For the benefit of the public, this is uh, the greatest increase over the last seven years. Um, and the primary driver for that is that Nevada County's Board of Supervisors has implemented a series of adjustments to bring them up to the market based on a survey of surrounding counties. So since your last adjustment, Nevada County Supervisors have had two adjustments of about a total of 20%, which uh, generates a, a slightly larger than average adjustment for you all this year. Uh, the resulting annual salary for the board will be approximately $92,000. Secondly, uh, I'm recommending a, an ordinance implementing a wage adjustment for the Office of the Sheriff Coroner Marshal of 4.5 percent. I'm sorry, yes, four and one half percent. This is a one-time equity adjustment to address compaction uh, due to the Sheriff's subordinate managers who have received a series of wage increases over the past three years of four, four and a quarter, and four and a half percent of which the sheriff, uh, sheriff's office, uh, the office of the sheriff coroner marshal uh, did not benefit. Therefore, HR is recommending a one-time adjustment as proposed in uh, the second ordinance for your consideration. The cost for both of these ordinances in the current fiscal year can be absorbed in the currently adopted budget for both the board's office and the sheriff's office. And that concludes my comments, but I'm certainly available for any questions. All right, thank you, Kate. Uh, Supervisor Gore. 
I mean, supervisor justice. justice. <laughs> the other one, that other one. Um, Kate, two, two questions. One on the Board of Supervisors' salary. I'm very sensitive about this issue. Obviously, our taxpayers um, look at that. And I'm going to ask you this question already knowing the answer, but getting it on public record. Are there any other special pays or benefits the Board of Supervisors receives? For their duties no ma'am thank you and and the reason I bring that up is I'd like to have more for every Mac meeting that we go to but uh, we don't and uh, especially last Thursday night I thought it was hazard duty but you know and that's a joke but um, um, perhaps but thank you can you. get one of those dusty robots to help you with your meetings I'm not sure. <laughs> Um, but I, I do want to be very aware that this is our taxpayers' dollars paying us for what we do. I know how hard we're all working, and I do appreciate the adjustment. Um, and I think uh, it's still a low salary compared to what many of us were making before we took these jobs, so I appreciate that. Um, secondly, for the sheriff, um, since uh, the offer has been to all of our employees at the four, four and a quarter, and four and a half. Why are we just doing a one time four and a half? Why not give him the benefit that we've given his leadership team and have put on the table to others? Thank you for the question, Supervisor Gustafson. Uh, the Office of the Sheriff Coroner Marshal has been treated similarly or, or the same as all of the other elected department heads. Mm -hmm. Your board has approved a series of wage increases for elected department heads that are on a, of a different amount and okay. timing than the safety managers who are subordinate to the sheriff, which is why this is a um, specific adjustment just for this one But it's not the only one, one that, yes, it, that's that he's qualified for. Correct. I just want to make sure that I was clear on that. Sorry I didn't ask you ahead of the meeting, but it hit me this morning that, gee, we've done these three years. Uh, for everyone else and we should do okay thank you, thank you. supervisor Landon. I just wanted to point out one thing related to the special pay so while we don't receive special pays per se there are small stipends for when you serve on LAFCO or APCD so there are if you're serving on other committees there are some additional stipends yeah depending I just on wanted to point that out. yeah <laughs> no no I know but as far as the county compensation yes. to us um, that's it fully transparent right. thank you all right, seeing no other comments from board members, is there anyone in the public that has wants to address the board on this issue? Are you just getting ready to come? <laughs> okay. Anybody online? All righty. Um, I think the, uh, re the request has been read into the record. Um, I need a, mo a motion and a second. I'll second. It's been moved by Supervisor Gus uh, Jones and seconded by Supervisor Gore. Uh, Gustafson. 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 Oh, okay. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. The item has been moved. Now we will now move to. Salary and benefit updates for bus drivers one and two. Good afternoon, members of the board and Chair Holmes. I'm Suzanne Holloway. I'm here on behalf of both the Human Resources Department and the Department of Public Works. There's three requests before you with this item. The first is to approve a side letter agreement between the County of Placer and the Placer Public Employees Organization, or PPEO, to adjust the salary and benefits of the classifications of bus driver one and bus driver two. The second request in order to implement that side letter is to amend the uncodified schedule of classifications and compensation ordinance to reflect the new salaries for bus driver one and two. And finally, an introduce an ordinance uh, to amend chapter three to also reflect these changes. I don't think I'm going to be giving you any earth shattering news to tell you that there has been a difficulty in recruiting and retaining bus drivers, um, particularly up in our Eastern County region. We currently have two bus lines or main divisions. One down here in the Western side of the county is the Placer um, Transit District or PCT, Placer County Transit. 
And then up in Tahoe, we have TART, which is the Tahoe Area Regional Transit District. I've provided you with some background in the report. This is a nationwide issue. Um, the American Public Transportation Association has surveyed nationwide transit districts, and it's been recognized that this has been a challenge for many, many years, but this has been exasperated with the COVID-19 pandemic. At the bottom of your report, you can see that even comparing calendar years, um, the number of qualified applicants or applications that have been submitted for both PCT and TART have decreased significantly um, prior to the pandemic. PCT was averaging somewhere in the hundreds of qualified applicants for uh, bus drivers. TART was in the 30-ish range, which seemed to meet needs, but even in those days, we were recruiting on a continuous basis. Following the pandemic, we're now down to about 50 qualified applicants in 2022 for PCT, and TART had 11. What's the impact of this? There has been, um, nationwide, there have been concerns with increased overtime, routes being either delayed or possibly eliminated, and Placer County has been no exception to that. There's been a significant increase in overtime requests. Um, many times our department has taken an all hands on deck approach and has tried to keep those buses running and keep those routes going at all costs. So they'll often have supervisory staff that's qualified to get behind a bus, take on a route to make sure that those um, are not canceled or reduced. During the last negotiations with PPEO, um, it was negotiated that Placer County Human Resources would look at the classifications and salaries of the bus driver one, two, and senior. As a result of that analysis, we are recommending an approximate 5% increase for the bus driver one and two. So the bus driver one will go from salary range general 25 to general 31. And for the bus driver two, we will go from general 49 to general 55. In addition to that, one of the things that we noticed trending nationwide and when we surveyed um, as many comparable agencies that we could find in the area, signing bonuses have also been implemented in order to entice people to come and work for their agencies. As a result, we're also requesting an up to $2,000 signing bonus, the first half of which would be paid at the one level once they can provide proof of the licensure requirements. And at the full journey level, it would be approximately four weeks into the job. And then the second half would be paid um, at the completion of 2,080 hours. We're hoping that the proposed market rate adjustments and sign signing bonus will um, better position Placer County to staff their vacancies. One thing I did want to point out on the, the front of the report, at the time this was written, we had about a 70% vacancy rate. As of today, um, I should correct that the number of allocated positions at TART is actually 28, and as of today, we have 14 vacancies. So we're at about a 50% rate. We do have one person who's in the pre-employment stages, but in terms of the number of applications that have been submitted for the current recruitment, for TART, we don't have any so far at the full journey level, and we have one application submitted. So with all of that, I'm happy to answer any questions and Will Gardner from the department is also here if you have any questions operationally. Okay, uh, any questions from board members? Of course, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm yes. gonna ask a yeah, question, of sorry. No. Um, and this is really to Will, again, for the public record. So we have a shortage of drivers. What has that meant to service delivery? Because I think that's what the public is questioning. Sorry, Suzanne, I just figured he'd... <laughs> uh, hi, Will Garner, Public Works Department. And um, so right now at TART, we're supposed to be operating our enhanced winter service. And what that means is the buses are supposed to run about every 30 minutes, especially in the peak morning and afternoon. Uh, instead, we're running hourly and during times of the day, taking like two hour gaps um, in the middle of the day so we can take the resources we do have and put them in the morning and the afternoon shifts. Um, and that's kind of been unheard of. We've never had like a suspended couple of hours during the day. It makes it very inconvenient for passengers to try and plan to get to and from. So they won't go someplace if they can't 
get back. And because I had a four hour meeting the other night and we talked about traffic and traffic congestion, there's also been impacts to our micro mass transit because they're being overwhelmed by the number of people trying to call them to get rides home from their employment. And do you have any, I mean, I can quote the numbers to the rest of the board, but you probably know that too, that there's sometimes two and three hour delays in yes. pickup times. What we're hearing is that, and it's not, it's actually not the norm, but it's the stories that you hear. Yeah. You do have all the statistics. Um, but you can go on and try to get a ride and, they'll, and you know, the app will show you you're going to wait 120 minutes uh, or something like that. And people just don't book those rides and, and they move on. Um, but that's not the norm with, with TART Kinetics. It's actually a great service. Um, um, but the problem there is there that organization, we don't staff those little buses. Right, that's, they do. That's yeah. contracted out. But we're just pushing the demand to yeah. other services that we're also funding. Yeah. So That's correct. And the point I was going to make is that they, they also have a hard time staffing as well. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other comments from board members? Suzanne Jones. Yes, I have, I have a question. Um, speaking of bus drivers and, and services, has, is this affecting our Placer County transit from the Roseville area downtown? Oh, uh, absolutely. Uh, actually, we're only running half of that service right now, not because of the drivers. It's, it's because the demand is still way down because the state offices are not going to work every day. So they're still working on a hybrid and when you have that, there's not as much of a demand on parking. So when you are driving, it's actually easier just to drive now for a lot of people. But uh, the loads were way down once the pand pandemic started three years ago almost, and they're inching back up, but not enough for us to restore the full service. But that's kind of a day-to-day, -day and we, we had to right now. We don't have the staff to, to put that back in full service but we're so working we, on we don't have the staff if we needed it we couldn't do it if if we needed it to go back to what's four buses instead of two uh -huh. we wouldn't have it right now actually that is a contracted out service and our contractor mv transportation they were having to fill in for them with our drivers at times so oh, wow. they're having trouble um, and that means the supervisor is probably coming off of another route and there's a tremendous amount of overtime being worked. So. Did, is there a requirement to um, take driving courses? I know they have to, I th believe to be a bus driver, you have to pass a certain um, driving test with the CHP. Isn't that correct? It's with the DMV. Oh, with the DMV. And it's, you have to have a class B license and you have to be able to pass all the elements of that test. And right, I think the schools, schools have to, they, their bus drivers have to pass with CHP. They have a lot more regulations yeah. than, than yeah. we do actually. So I'm just wondering, is there a cost to people who would want to get a bus driver's license? Is there a cost to them? Well, what I'll, what I'll say for Placer County, we, we do free training. I mean, well, paid training is what I should say. We hire you as a dri bus driver one don't have a license so y'all could apply um, and and we would train you as a uh, bus driver it takes a long time though My retirement. yeah <laughs> talk to you and and um, but I will say that we lose maybe 60% of the people who come on as a driver one during that process they, they decide maybe that's not the job for them so. kind of totally off the topic but would it do us any good to make some kind of advertising for you know bus drivers and we pay for your driver's training and i mean something to that extent so i, I will entice, say our hr department has been incredible <laughs> in, in putting the word out in all of the traditional and a lot of non-traditional spots right now and um, we have staff going to job fairs and heard some other great ideas some vocational training locations at sierra college or we're trying to reach out and you know just get the word out there we are getting applicants, so we know people are seeing it. It's just um, we're not getting enough. Okay. So. Well, great. I just wanted to offer our help if there's any way that we can help. Thank, Thank you. you so much for your answers. This is, you know, this is a nationwide uh, challenge. Every, behind, every time I get behind a truck and trailer uh, on the back, it says drivers wanted. <laughs> so we're, we're not the only ones in this. So. Um, I, the uh, action requested has been written, written, and written. It's been put into the record. I, <laughs> moved by Supervisor Gustin, second by Supervisor Gore. 
let's see. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The item is moved. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Thank Suzanne. Thank you to HR for wearing Thanks. red today. Yeah. <laughs> you look very nice. <laughs> And uh, Nicole. Yes, good this afternoon. Is, uh, I'm Hatch. I got the memo. Yeah. <laughs> Agreement for Workers' Compensation Third Party Administrative Services. Yes, good afternoon. Nicole Lopez. Chair Holmes, members of the board, Nicole Lopez, Assistant Director of Human Resources, here to present for your consideration an agreement with Athens Insurance Services Incorporated. Under the California Labor Code, all employers must provide workers' compensation benefits to their employees. The county is self-insured in providing those benefits to the employees, and as such must re meet the requirements under the workers' compensation California laws. And to administer the self-insured program, the county retains the services of a third-party administer to manage the processing of workers' compensation claims and to ensure the county complies with various laws, regulations, and procedures that govern a self-insured workers' compensation program. The Human Resources Department has been working to enhance and improve the management of the workers' compensation program with increased emphasis on injury prevention, effective claims management, and return to work programs. The third party administrator is an integral partner in ensuring the success of these efforts. In collaboration with procurement, bids for the third party administrator services were solicited through a request for proposal process to determine the best option for securing high quality claims administration. The RFP included specific performance expectations and several enhancements to ensure a higher level of service than currently provided, including additional accountability measures, such as documented supervisory audits, advanced claims management software technology, which will also provide service not only to workers' compensation, but also the general liability and property claims that are processed through risk management, as well as alternative staffing models. As a result of the RFP process, the evaluation panel unanimously selected the top rate firm, which is the Athens Insurance Services. Upon approval by this board, the agreement with Athens would begin March 1st. So today for your consideration is to approve the award and contract with Athens Insurance Services to authorize the Director of Human Resources to sign the agreement and all required documents, and then a budget amendment in the amount of $52,600 to cover the increased cost from our current vendor to the new vendor for the remaining of the fiscal year, which will come out of reserves. I'm available to answer any questions along with Brett Wood from Procurement and other Human Resources staff as well. Okay, any comments, questions from board members? I see none. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to address the, the board on this item? Is there anybody online? I see none, Chair. Okay, then uh, we need to have a motion for an agreement. I move approval of the item. I'll second. Supervisor Gore makes the motion. Supervisor Jones seconds. Uh, will the clerk please call the roll? Gore? Aye. Landon? Yes. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Holmes? Aye. Thank you. Now we'll move to item 11A, procurement, asphalt paving and patching services, uh, Baldoni Construction Service. Good morning, supervisors. Good morning, Brett. Actually, good afternoon. My name is Brett Wood. I'm your purchasing manager. I'm here today to ask you to approve an award of a competitive bid with Baldoni Construction of Newcastle for asphalt and paving and patching services in the amount not to exceed $900,000 for the period of February 14th through December 20, 31st of this year, as well as to request your board approve two renewals in that same dollar amount annually, uh, as well as the change order authority of up to $90,000 for those renewals. Authorize the purchasing manager to sign all required documents and then make a finding that the requested actions for these are exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act pursuant to CEQA guidelines section 157 or 15378 and 15601. 
is a little bit of background for your board. We have previously had the same contract in place. We reissued a new, our contract expired at the end of last year. We worked with facilities, parks and open space, and public works on finding a new contractor for this, updating our bid requirements and putting it back out to bid. There were three responsive bids to this. Baldoni is by far the least expensive option for the county and has provided these same services in the past. With that, happy to respond to any questions and respectfully request your board's approval. Supervisor Gustafson. I strongly want to support anything we can do on asphalt repair. We have potholes the size of craters on many county roads uh, because of freeze thaw this year. And I get emails after emails on flat tires and there's memes and there's social media with people naming them and there's also a scuba divers going in like they'll show a scuba diver this you know <laughs> deep in the pothole so a lot of humor going around the tahoe area about placer county roads so strongly support moving forward any volkswagens um, <laughs> no i haven't seen that but people share a lot of colorful memes with me <laughs> thank you uh i see no more comments Anybody in the audience have a, I want to address us? Anybody? No, no. no. Approval. And I'll second. Yes, uh, before I call for the vote, I just want to say that uh, Baldoni uh, Construction Services, a longtime Placer County family, the Baldoni family, and uh, I'm glad to see that we're giving, uh, giving this award to a, a homegrown Placer County company. Uh, all those in favor of the item, please say aye. 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 Any uh, opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none. Uh, the item is approved. Thank you. Thank you. And nice bread. Yeah. yeah. Very nice. Well, since we've had an action-packed morning here, uh, we're going to uh, take item 12A after our 1, 1 p.m. Uh, timed item, and this will allow us to uh, go out for a closed session and maybe a bite to eat. I'll turn this over to the county council. The board will now adjourn to closed session to consider one item of real property negotiations, four items of existing litigation, one item of potential litigation, and two items under labor negotiations.
The board has just returned from closed session and the county council will, will report out. The board met in closed session to consider real property negotiations. The board heard a report and provided direction on a 5-0 vote. In Kadami versus Noe, the board heard a report and authorized defense of the named county defendants. In Miskowitz versus County, the board heard a report and provided direction on a 5-0 vote. On Wilson versus County of Placer, the board heard a report, no action requested or taken. In the matter of the Placer County Deputy Sheriff's Association versus County, the board heard a report and provided direction on a 5-0 vote. In the matter of anticipated litigation, one potential case of exposure to litigation, the board heard a report no action requested or taken. On the matter of labor negotiations, the PCDDAA, the board heard a report and provided direction on a 5-0 vote. In labor negotiations, PC Lima, the board heard a report and provided direction on a 5-0 vote. This concludes the report out of closed session. Now we'll move to our one o'clock timed item. This is county executive federal fiscal year 2024 directed congressional spending requests. Joel Joyce. Thank you, Chair. Once again, Joel Joyce, the county executive office. I'm pleased to be here before your board um, today to get direction on what projects, programs, whatever you want to call it, to pursue for our. <laughs> federal earmarks for federal fiscal year 2024. So brief presentation here before I turn it over to your board for discussion purposes. Um, congressional directed spending, uh, I'll refer to them as earmarks uh, from here on out, it's a little easier to say. Just typical general definition, uh, member of Congress represents a certain discretion, discretionary amount for a certain project within a certain district. And then um, the idea behind earmarks is that elected officials can direct spending to their districts as they know what projects are more important than federal agencies. And then also in theory, the idea behind earmarks is it makes getting the yes votes a little easier um, as there is something typically for every member of Cong Congress in these spending bills. So a brief, hist brief uh, presentation on history of earmarks. They have been around uh, since basically the country's founding. Uh, 1789 to, I'll say, the mid-1990s. Uh, earmarks were, were utilized during this time period, but in a less formal manner. The second, uh, the second big time frame there, uh, 1990 to 2000, earmarks became more popular. Um, as government became divided in the mid-1990s, appropriations chairs, both in, the, both in the House and Senate, recognized the importance of earmarks, both on their chairmanships at the time within the appropriations committees as well as uh, getting their members reelected. And that brings us to the third big moment, uh, 2000 to 2011, as earmarks became more popular, uh, funding for these projects increased. And um, with that, what you typically saw are, were a lot of uh, bribery scandals, quid pro quo scandals, um, a lot of pro money, federal funding directed towards projects that really didn't help the nation or the community. Uh, you know, the bridge to no nowhere is a prime example that was built up in Alaska. And then from 2011 to 2021, why you see that gap, gap there is earmarks were banned. Um, that was because of all the scandals. And then in 2021, earmarks were brought back, and this was due to a study or um, a report out that was done by the Select Committee to Modernize Congress. The idea behind this Select Committee was to present uh, reforms for Congress to make Congress work better. Um, and this was one of the reforms was, hey, let's bring back earmarks, but let's make it more transparent uh, for the public and our members at large. So what happened with Placer County's success? There were numerous awards before 2011. Um, doing some research going back to 1990, I think the county received somewhere between 30 and 35 what I'll call earmarks um, from them. Our first earmark that I could find was $2.7 million for Forest Hill Road improvements and widening. That was done in 1998. And then I, I uh, listed some of the larger earmarks that 
the county has gotten over the years with the I-80 um, from, I think, the Placer County line to 65, and then uh, seven plus million for wastewater treatment plant uh, work. Um, and then the second bullet there is our most recent earmark, which was the Placer County Sheriff's Office Body Worn Camera Program. The, con the important thing to recognize on this slide in the context of it is the difference in amounts. Um, we're not in the 1990s, 2000s anymore. Um, so no, nowhere will we be getting 70 plus million dollars um, in earmark requests. We could certainly ask for it, but it's uh, not gonna happen. So uh, it's, it's important to note with that slide. So some guidelines going forward. Uh, important thing to note is nothing has been released yet. So we're, we're kind of working off what was given to us in 2021 and 2022. Uh, so with that, uh, we are expecting a late, late March submittal date and, and a bit of on the process. Should these projects get submitted in March, what they, they go through a project submittal process through our elected official offices. This will be with both of our senators and our congressmen. At that point, the senator's office and the congressional office go through all their project requests select a handful up until the appropriate amount, and I'll talk about that uh, in a bit. And then it, it moves forward. It moves forward to the appropriations process. And through that appropriations process, the appropriations subcommittees meet, they finalize their recommendations for the project, and then move that forward within the entire uh, federal budget bill. Uh, this entire process takes almost a year. Theoretically, it should be done by September 30th with a new federal fiscal year starting October 1st. Um, it hasn't been done by September 30th in a decade plus at this point. So nor do I think this year it's, it's going to. So I would expect ultimately if Placer County is successful on one or multiple projects, uh, we wouldn't receive the check until probably this time in 2024. So a few considerations. Um, I did talk about earlier about the appropriate amounts that each congressional office receives. As part of the reform process, uh, both Senate and the House recommend that the total amount of earmarks do not exceed 1% of the federal discretionary budget. So this year that's expected to be about one point, well the entire budget should be about 1.5 trillion, meaning uh, 15 billion of that will be spent on earmarks. Um, there are 535 members of Congress, 100 senators, 435 members of the House. So that comes out to about $28 million uh, per member. What typically happens is House members will get a little less than $28 million. You'll typically see about $15 million on the House side. Senators will get more than their $28 million. Um, within that, uh, senators and congressional members from high-cost states, such as California, will typically see a little bit more. Um, you know, typically our projects cost a little bit more than it would in, in another state. Um, so that's where we're at. Uh, you know, I did see some, some of our senators' projects last year get funded in the 20 plus million dollar range. Uh, in total, um, I think Padilla and Feinstein brought back about 70 to 100 million dollars each to the state of California. We're on our house side. Um, at the time, Congressman LaMalfa brought back, I want to say 16 to 17 million, but don't quote me on that. Um, so a few other considerations. Uh, one, like I said, is, is the dollar amount of the projects I'm, I'm asking your board uh, to pick today. I would, you know, ultimately it's, it's up to your board to choose. I would recommend, in talking with our federal lobbyists as well, no more than $5 million. Less is always better in this case. Um, timing and delivery of the pro project is important too. On the timing piece, as I mentioned, we wouldn't receive funding until probably February 2024. So if there's an urgent need, you're not gonna get a check for a year. And then beyond that, uh, the federal government does expect us to expend the funds, uh, typically within a 24 month time frame. Um, the earlier, the better with that as well. If, you know, if we're in the process, we can probably extend it a few months beyond that. Um, and then on the, the last point, delivery of the project. It's important that whatever we fund request to be funded, and it is funded that this county delivers on successfully completing that project. Um, if we don't, obviously we would have to return the funding 
and then it just it makes it that much more difficult uh, to receive funding awards in the future. We've had to do that, not with an earmark, but with a previous federal funding award, um, and that is not a fun process to go through. Another consideration is uh, they want to see government and public support. So what they, what they mean by this is it's on a regional plan, whether it's the state transportation improvement plan, whether it's been adopted through SACOG or TRPA's master plan, or sometimes our own master plans as a county, parks and trails, things like that. Um, that it's, this is not just a project picked out of thin air. It's already been reviewed and vetted uh, by the elected body, in this case your board and other elected bodies. And then uh, the political realities of, of how this goes. And, and that goes into our next slide. Um, the big political reality is the committee assignments in which our elected officials sit. So our two senators, and I've listed their, their committees here and only their chairs of the subcommittees. They are on multiple subcommittees in which they're not chairs. But the, the higher end com subcommittees and committees are, are listed here. The big thing to note on this slide is Senator Feinstein on the Appropriations Committee. Um, that is where all requests will go through at the Senate side. So it's important um, to at least have her support on our projects and we'll, we'll go through that lobbying effort when the time comes. And then obviously the energy and water chair through that. And you'll see Senator Padilla's um, committee assignments below that. Next slide, Kevin Kiley, obviously a newer, newest member of office. He's on the Judiciary and Workforce and Education Committee uh, with the Subcommittee on Workforce Protection. Um, and chairing of that. Um, so that's kind of it on the political realities in, in the projects as a whole. Um, I do, before I kind of turn it over to your board here, I do want to let you know I did reach out to some of our partner, partner agencies and cities uh, to kind of see how they're going through the process. Um, you know, Roseville, none of them have completely decided yet on what they're going after, for funding for. Roseville did possibly mention a broadband project. Obviously, we're not going to hold them to any of this. Uh, PCWA might go for some uh, road restoration work in the um, mosquito fire area. And then TRPA is looking at quite a few projects uh, in and around the basin, and they're still talking with their um, local representatives, both on the California side and the Nevada side, on various projects that they may go for. Um, so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions or turn it over to the chair for discussion purposes. I do have a few folks here. Um, I will say, actually, before I turn it over, you did receive in your packet a project list. That project list is not every project in the county. It is not every important project in the county or even your district. Um, there are many things uh, that could be on this list. It is what was generated in the time frame we had, really meant for discussion purposes. So don't, don't think what's on here or what's not on here um, is, is an issue, for, for lack of a better term. So, uh, we do still have some staff here to help answer any questions if on a specific project. Not everyone could be available today, but we'll, we'll try our best. Thank you. So, Joel, uh, in your staff report, it says project funding request should be in the one to three million dollar range. So, to, <clears throat> to get to that point, and I, I, I did say five uh, in my wow. discussion with you. So, that was written about a month ago based on deadlines we had to get in. Uh -huh. um, that has now changed just do a, a higher limit, um, five, five million is, is seen more appropriate, up to five million. Up to five million. So it seems that if we ask for up to five million dollars for one of these projects or any of these projects, that money has to be spent within two years. And even though, for example, um, forest treatment projects, we could uh, ask for five million for a part of that forest treatment, but it has to be a project that can be completed in two years. Yes, and, and there has to be, a, I will say, like a, a finite end to a request. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll use forest management project as an example. We can't just say we need you know, $5 million to treat this part of the forest. There needs to be a plan in place. Yeah. Hey, we're using this $5 million to treat, just throwing numbers out there, these 1,000 acres in this area. Uh, it can't just be generic, uh -huh. um, but yes, it, it has to be spent, yes. Yeah. And, you know, there's accounting, I would say, ways around that, move money around to make sure the federal funding is spent first. Yeah. Um, but that's the, and there's a 30% match uh, locally. That's typically kind of, they, that's what they like to see. Yeah. Like I said, there's, 
these are guidelines. They're not hard and fast rules. Um, it just makes it easier. So there are some here that, uh, for example, dual, dual band radios for 1.2 million. That would be, I think that would be something that could be uh, asked for and funded and completed in two years. Right. Already, oh, I got lights. Oh, to my left, my goodness, I'm surprised, shock, shock. Uh, who do I, oh, Supervisor Gore, you go ahead. All right, thank you, well, I appreciate it. Uh, my first question, and Joel, thank you for this list, and I know there's a lot of projects, but are there anything on here, is there anything on here that we just know that can't be done within two, month, two years? Because that might be helpful. Um, I just, I wanna ask that question, and that may, and maybe there's a portion of, right? Um, so as you look at that, I want to share with my colleagues some thoughts, which I think is really helpful. Um, the committee assignments that Senator Feinstein, Senator Padilla have, which means that they're more interested and they have some, a little bit more weight there. And it, and it looks like energy, water, public works, right? And those are infrastructure projects, projects that I think are really important for our residents. And I, I think about some of these and I, I see the need and I also look at projects that may not have funding elsewhere. So if I look at like the, I think there's a sewer project for Liswa, right, where ratepayers might end up paying for it. But the Sheridan water um, project, where there's never any money in Sheridan. Like that's a project that I think warrants it. Uh, it's really difficult to get money for it. And it's a disadvantaged community. Disadvantaged community. So Senator Padilla will like that. Well, and, and let's talk about, right, those yeah. things that are important to our representatives that, um, and, uh, that also might have some joint benefit, too, mm -hmm. as, I, as I think about some of these. Um, so as I've said those things, are there anything, anything here that we're just like, you know what, that's a pie in the sky, that's nice, but it just doesn't make sense to ask for funding for it. So to answer your question, it's a little difficult. Um, when I said earlier to, super, to Chair Holmes' question, there's, there's a, there has to be a finite end. Most of these projects, yes, they're not gonna be completed in whole, right? The baseline road, Riega Whiting, is not gonna be done in two years. You know, a regional public safety training center is not gonna be built in two years. However, there are phase, I mean, I'll use the word term phases. There are phases to each of these projects to which we can apply funding, whether we're in a planning phase or the actual capital construction phase. Does that help? Mm -hmm. So Right, because I could say, hey, we've got Baseline Riego Road, right? That's a long-term project. But I've got three jurisdictions working together to address a current problem, which is congestion, which would allow for, you know, movement, less traffic, less air quality issues, um, et cetera. And, you know, we could find a portion of that project very easily, right? Um, so I, so I appreciate that. And you know, I, as I look at this, I really want this to be something that, as we're making asks, it's not about my district or somebody else's district, but projects or things that we know are just really needed, right? Like I look at biomass, oh my goodness. Like I would wanna put, biomass is probably one of my first ones up there, just because we know the need, we know the wildfire issues, we know the opportunity. I would love to see that. Um, and like I mentioned, the Sheridan project, disadvantaged community. Um, they certainly need that. Um, there was, we could always use more m money for our um, forest health. We, if we talk about what our needs are as a county and our focus as a county, forest health is super important. Um, I'll, I'll stop there because I'll let my colleagues share their opinions. Okay. Supervisor Gustafson. Um, thank you. And uh, the danger in having five board members look at what staff has put together is we know only so much. But what I do know is meeting with these senators, they have pet projects and pet interest areas. Senator Padilla is going to look at disadvantaged communities where we can assist them as best we can. Senator Feinstein is going to be about forest health and transportation. She, she's a big advocate and certainly for Tahoe, understanding that our funding formulas never let Tahoe projects move forward the way other areas with more population do. 
Um, and so part of this is you working with their staff to carve, to present a menu and make them interesting enough. So like Forest Health, Forest Treatment Projects, various forest treatment projects I know doesn't, isn't very sexy. If we talk about pilot programs, matching dollars, maybe it's a 50% match where the um, private properties to help them get defensible space done in communities where incomes are low, I mean, those things will sell well. And it's all how you package it, you know this. So I'm not, I'm preaching to the choir, but where we can make it unique and different, the crime lab, you know, because there's so many agencies and partners in various counties, that could really get a U.S. Senator's attention because, gee, we've got, you know, other counties signing on. Um, again, I don't know if those other counties are willing to put it in their funding package request, so we'd be helping them, but those things are important. I tend to shy away from enterprise functions unless you're a disadvantaged community, just because I know sewer should be able to generate from facility fees and from user fees right. some amount of revenue, and we should find ways to do that with county. But innovation, pilot programs, serving federal needs with private dollars, protecting our private communities from federal lands with the forest health projects, but do them close to the communities um, because that's where the communities will see and feel it and how we can pilot those home hardening. Um, and North Auburn might have some disadvantaged areas, mm -hmm. uh, you know, on uh, both the sewer and or forest health areas. Um, there's other areas that won't. But I, kn I know you can take the menu and we'll be happy for anything we get, but I think really making those compelling cases and um, Anything we can do, elected to elected, to help further those cause and narrow those specific asks ahead of going to D.C. You don't have to go to D.C. to have relationships with your elected. So, so to, to respond to some of your points, and you make great points. Thank you, Supervisor. Um, there is always a story to tell within each of these projects. Uh, they typically align with the public health and safety piece of, of everything, right? You can use air quality in this. Um, you know, disadvantaged communities, tran transit, get, get folks moving. Um, so that's a good point. And then to, to your other point about working with elected officials, yes, there is a, um, much staff-to-staff -staff communication. Um, I will say, to be honest, at the end of the day, it's going to come down to you as elected officials to sell the project to the elected office. Um, we'll typically convene a call in early April mm -hmm. um, with the congressional or Senate office um, to pitch these projects once they're finalized um, and then kind of go forward and um, work with the appropriations committee staff both in the house and the senate at that point we'll bring along the elected officials as well through that process over the summer and then ultimately to get it through the finish line uh, during budget negotiations in the fall and then the 30 percent local match if we exceed that every grant i've ever or any money i've ever asked for if you can exceed your local match that gets their interest because you've shown public support correct and the, and the theory behind that match um and this is how it was relayed to me a few years ago when we first embarked on this process was that the project wasn't kind of picked out of thin air it has some that you've, you've gotten support for you've gotten funding for or in this case, the board is willing to kind of put up their own money to help fund a portion of this project. And, and that's really where it comes from. Whether it's a 30% match, a 10% match, or a 75% match, I'm not sure you know, the realities of how those different percentages matter, I think, but just the idea that uh, there's other folks, including the elected body, that is putting up their own funding. Okay. Uh, Jane, you've had a comment? Your light's on. Yes, thank you, Board Chair. Um, Joel, I'm wondering if you can speak to the bill that was recently advanced by both Senators Feinstein and Padilla, the Wildfire Emergency Act of 2023, and talk about how our Regional Public Safety Training Center concept aligns with their goal to es essentially establish FEMA West to train the next generation of firefighters. Yes, so Senator Feinstein, I believe it's Senate Bill 121. I, I have to go back and look. Um, had spoke to releasing a bill last I checked which was late last week the bill text hasn't been fully released 
but I, I did read her comments uh, on the Senate floor when she introduced the bill. Um, among a few different policy changes within the bill, I should back up, this bill is very similar to the bill that was introduced last year by uh, Senator Feinstein and Senator Padilla as well. But among some uh, policy changes in regards to, to forest management projects on federal lands, um, she and Senator Padilla, I should also mention her, Senator Daines is a co-author co of this bill out of Montana, uh, did include wording within the legislation that would require the federal government to set up a prescribed fire training center in the West. Um, and that last part is quoted. Um, I don't know where in the West this would go. Uh, I, like I said, I, I haven't seen the text of the bill. I'm pretty sure there wasn't appropriations within the bill to actually build the center. I think it's just kind of a planning phase at this point. But to, to Jane's point, um, this could help advance part of this uh, regional public safety training center or, or help build on that, right, as we focus maybe on police and sheriff law enforcement activities now into not only um, urban firefighting but wildland firefighting as well. Um, and, I, and, and to further clarify, I think this word, that facility would be a partnership um, between the U.S. Forest Service and FEMA. Suzanne. Yeah, hi, Joel. Thank you for this um, outline. Um, I have a question, though, about some things that are not actually on your list. Mm -hmm. Just curious. <laughs> so um, any discussion on broadband? Um, because broadband affects our county pretty much at large. We all have pockets of broadband necessities. Any chance of anybody talking about broadband? So I think there were some initial discussions. They, they didn't make it on the list, and it's not to say they're not important. Um, I'm sure if the board said, hey, IT, let's go right. fund a broadband project, we'd be more than happy to. Uh -huh. um, there's, to, to Supervisor Gustafson's point, or Gore's point, I believe, um, there is so much money out there with broadband right now. It's in, I don't want to put words in IT's mouth, <laughs> so please, if, if Jarrett or, or Dieter's listening, um, yeah, so uh, um, there's a lot of funding out there. I know we're working with the FCC to kind of nail down the maps. Everyone's kind of heard of these broadband maps that we have to nail down to see where the infrastructure is going to go on the federal side, where the state's going to put their infrastructure, because um, that will help enable us to figure out where we as a county need to fund our projects. Because I. I can give you a little bit of where the state and the federal dollars are going. I can't give you everywhere where the state and federal dollars are going. And, um, you know, I, broadband's important, don't get me wrong. We're probably a year or so, maybe a few years out from really, I, you know, I, I know Jarrett and IT have their project list, and I know they can find something to fund for a million or two million dollars or so, but I think Well, I, th I think to Supervisor Jones, if I could, my gut is they'd probably say, hey, we just funded a huge amount into broadband nationwide. We don't want to take our limited dollars and put more into broadband, right? right. In their earmark request, or their congressional, congressionally request. request, whatever the title is for an earmark now. But that, that would be my guess, because yes. they want to make a difference in other areas, given that they've invested a lot in broadband. Right. Well, looking over the, the list, it seemed like most of the list are pretty project specific and, and specific to certain areas of the county, not countywide, broadly countywide, except for trails and projects. Um, I know my district, they want more trails, they want connectivity to schools for safe travel for kids. I have neighborhoods that don't even have sidewalks that go up to, to um, elementary schools that we're trying to we're trying to work on some solutions to that. Um, they want connectivity to um, restaurants, stores, you know, go for coffee, go for dinner kind of a thing. Um, but let's face it, my community is not an underserved community. We are not going to get grant money for being underserved. We have a couple of schools perhaps that are underserved and that's it. So whereas these other areas, when you talk about them being underserved, at least they have opportunities for applying for grant money because they're underserved. So I think the trails and the trail projects 
might be something that can be applied countywide, um, particularly for those areas. You have them, Cindy. I have them. Bonnie, you probably have a few exclusive ones. I mean, you're getting exclusive ones as well that, you know, we're not going to be eligible for grant money, basically. So I think that might be a good, good idea. And then transportation, maybe more specifically, like the Placer Parkway. I don't know. That thing's been in the planning for 10 years, and, you know, we're talking about not having it come to fruition for another 10 to 20. I don't know. I know. Nobody wants to give transportation money. Is that so it? we did apply for Placer Parkway funding the last two years, uh, I believe, and I think last year we asked for twenty million dollars through Padilla's office. It made it to the second round, I believe. Um, he did it. I know Padilla did advance it on. Um, it just wasn't selected ultimately. Yeah. Um, and then prior to that, obviously, and, and Ken can talk more about this if you have more questions on the federal funding piece on the at least for Phase One of Parkway. I think we went after, oh geez, I want to say 10 years of grants of the big federal competitive grant right. projects through the Build, Raise, Tiger, um, all that. So, and then we did try our, try our, our hand at the earmark process, process the last two years, but ultimately wasn't successful. I mean, I do agree with the um, public safety training center, especially where it concerns um, wildfire um, training. I do kind of feel like we always need to have forest treatment projects, at least in the back of our minds. You know, I don't think we should ever quite give up on that. And then biomass, I think biomass is something that we really, really, really need. That's where everything is going and we need to have some projects where we can spend the money. Thank you, that's about it Supervisor for me. Gore. Thank you, just um, appreciate those points. Something that came to my mind as you shared which committees Congressman Kiley is on, which is workforce protections. And the last item here, the employment services with uh, child mm -hmm. support services and HHS. If there was a project that actually did help these folks who owed money to Child Protective Services help them get jobs so that they could actually pay their child support, that would be tremendous. So I don't know if that's of all interest of the congressman, but if we can find a project like that, I mean, it sounds like there's a need. Bus drivers and forest health. Well, right, I mean, so we have a need for workers, yeah. and we've got people who need help with resume writing and getting good and getting at least reasonable Job paying training. jobs so that they can take care of their children. That might be something that the congressman, based on his committee assignments, it might be a good fit. Yeah. And, and, they'll be, uh, and to that project, obviously, it's a requested um, funding request from the departments, but to that project, as well as others on this list and, and others not on this list, there are other, like you had mentioned, there are other federal opportunities. So the, the the benefit to this process is you get projects onto the elected officials' radar, where if it's not funded through the through the earmark process, staff can, can at the elected level, the, the Congress and Senators level, can work to get some of these funding requests into other appropriation bills. I don't expect a lot, but they're out there. Jean, you had a comment? Certainly, thank you, Chair. In response to Supervisor Jones' question, uh, please remember, too, that the board dedicated a tranche of your ARPA money to broadband, right. and I know our IT team plans to follow up with each board member on a plan for right. strategically deploying those funds. But, but we already know that's going to be woefully in, insufficient, really, uh, in the long term and, and, and what it's going to cover countywide. But I, yes, I do, I do remember that. I've got people in my, my constituents that are working hard on it. <laughs> Supervisor Landon. Um, well, as I was kind of perusing um, and just thinking about strategically how we make our projects come to the forefront of Padilla's and Feinstein's mind, I think one of the things that's really important is for their staff to be on the same page as well. And just thinking back to former lobbying efforts with their staffs, they tend to be relatively young, at least the people that we've met with in the past. And so um, looking through the list of what's here, um, 
I think anything related to um, what Cindy and Bonnie said about underserved populations, I think is going to resonate with the, I don't want to, I don't want to generalize their staffs because I know that they have experienced people who are older as well, but I'm just kind of making a generalization. So um, I think the employment services thing, in my opinion, would probably resonate because it's bettering the community. It's it's making changes for the future for those people who might otherwise make poor decisions. So I could see that being of interest. To me, microtransit is something that I would definitely think would be of interest to them, even though it might not be at the forefront of my own personal mind. I think it would make a huge difference in Tahoe um, and knowing Feinstein's support for, um, for Tahoe. I, I would imagine that would be something that would she would be open to. And then of course, forest treatment, I think with the messaging of its connection to public health and air quality, of the impacts that it has on our communities for those you know few months a year that we have to suffer. <laughs> so those were a few that came to mind for me. Supervisor Jones, did you have another comment? Yes, I do. I do have another comment. Um, I wanted to talk about the employment services because I think this is a great idea, but I wonder if we could talk a little bit about expanding this. Um, our last chat with probation services said that we have approximately 4,000 probationers in Placer County, and roughly, I think they said 40% are homeless. And so I'm just wondering if we couldn't go further with the, the job services to where we help and support those that have either been through um, the incarceration process and maybe are not on probation, as well as the, who, those who are on probation, and see if we can't offer some kind of services to help get those people employed. It's just, a, it's just an idea I thought we could do, do to expand that. Not just, for, not just for men who can't pay child support, but for, for men, women, and, uh, who, who just can't get jobs, period, you know, and they're homeless or for whatever. A lot of them are homeless because they've lost jobs or can't get jobs. What can we do to help those people? Supervisor Gore. And just one last thing. Um, you made a point about Senator Feinstein. I'm not sure how much longer she will be our senator, but to supervise- Not running. Two years. Not running, two years. <laughs> there you go, that's it. Um, so to Supervisor Gustafson's point about projects in Tahoe typically not getting funded, um, and I don't know enough about the Fannie Bridge and the State Route 89 to 67, but if there is an opportunity to get money from our senator in an area that she loves before she leaves and one of these projects might really hit home, I, I would be supportive of that just because I hadn't even really realized that your area is really challenged with getting those federal dollars for those projects. And I'm like, let's take advantage of ask, making an ask before she's not there any longer. Yeah, yeah that's great. Supervisor Gustafson. Okay, sorry. Um, I just wanted to add on to the job training um, because, and I wanted to share with the board something I, I don't think I've shared with you. Um, I serve on a nonprofit board that just funded full scholarships to uh, the community college at South Lake Tahoe for people to be trained in for starting forestry careers. Fully subscribed waiting list of young people who are interested in doing that. And I'm certain if we worked on that down here as well, or with the training center, with job skills, whether it's people that are currently through child support services or young people coming up, I think those sorts of long-term investments in our future um, do appeal to our, especially through our community college system for uh, both Senator Padilla and Feinstein. So anything along those lines that can both further our first forestry goals as well as serving community, uh, people that need assistance. So I, I'm looking at some of the more immediate needs. Um, for example, the Sheridan water reliability. Uh, seems like that's a, dis uh, I know it's a disadvantaged community. Uh, they need a couple wells, so that's 1.5 million would uh, more than uh, take care of that issue for them. Uh, otherwise, I don't know how they're ever going to get it done. So I'd like to see that put in the uh, hopper. 
<clears throat> and then the North Auburn sewer as well, only because we do have some properties out there that are uh, that we can use for more affordable housing. And one of the challenges is hooking up to the sewer, uh, as we saw with the uh, um, Jan Haldeman's project in, out in North Auburn. Uh, that would be something that I'd like to see. Right. And um, a point on the North, the North Auburn sewer project listed here, um, I believe in the description I had, it was awarded uh, grant funding from SACOG. Mm -hmm. That is actually still to go before vote before the SACOG Board of Directors uh, here fairly soon. Thursday. So, yeah, so I, I, I jumped the gun a little bit. I know it's somewhat public, um, but I just want to say it, it hasn't been finalized. But okay. So how soon do you need to uh, submit these requests? So they haven't released anything yet. Um, if, if folks followed kind of the media, uh, it took a while to, to pick a speaker um, and oh, yeah. get the committee assignments. So the House is about a month behind, three weeks behind a schedule, a you know, typical schedule. Um, the last few years, the end of January to mid-February is when the kind of guide, guidance was released. Um, I, the guidance hasn't been released yet. I'm hoping by the end of this month, and I imagine we'll have three to four weeks to, to submit the projects. Um, I will say for the, for the entire board here, when staff works on submitting these projects, it's a fairly simple form. What we really try to do is get a, a regional support. Uh, we will comb far and wide everywhere we can go to get letters of support from, from not only jurisdictions, but nonprofits, NGOs, uh, things like that up and down the state to be honest so it's it's the letter support process that probably takes takes the longest and then also the uh, dual band radios uh, is important for public safety so our uh, police uh, our law enforcement agencies can speak to each other during these crises these, these kinds of crises we have so all right I'm going to try to bring this back because I know we're kind of all over the, the gamut here. So what I, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, your board, what I'm hearing is, is at least one forced treatment project, forced health project. So I have that. Um, that's the only thing I've kind of heard from all, all five of you. So I, you know, I can certainly work with, with Josh and Carrie and, and their staff on, on submitting um, the appropriate project with that unless your board has a specific need in a specific area. Um, beyond that, I've heard a few things a couple of times. One's shared in water. Um, mm -hmm. that, that was a piece. And uh, Supervisor Gustafson, I know you had mentioned a, just a few, kind of a menu of Tahoe projects. And no, we can no, certainly. Not, I mean, a, a menu of projects in general. And I don't mean just okay. Tahoe, because biomass could be in mm -hmm. any, you know, I think you get. You work with their staff yes, to see correct. where they're key because they'll have other requests and they'll want to have a geographic and a subject, right? Mm -hmm. They typically look to distribute funds in a number of different categories and ways. So, yeah, so having a menu is always helpful. What, what staff would typically do is take your board's recommendation direction today and then we'll meet with each of the congressional staff and then we'll say, okay, here, this, these are the three, five projects we're looking at in these dollar amount, these dollar ranges. Is there anything that would appeal to your boss, or your, um, you know, whoever that may be? And they, they may say yes. They may sometimes they say apply for whichever, whichever thing you want to apply for. Well, I definitely agree with Sheridan Water, disadvantaged community, and I think you heard that. And biomass, biomass. was another one. Forest health. Um, the training programs for employment, that was didn't we all kind of nod that way, mm -hmm. too? I don't know. That's just my... Seems like there's at least sort of interest in yeah. four areas That's across four. the board. And then, it, and, and then you can sort of like, hey, the radios, right? I mean, if somebody really wants to do more for law enforcement, you can get that sense of, mm -hmm. then we've got, we definitely have this project, right? And I think we can sort of trust you to know you know, what cards to play with who the players are, right? That might be something um, the congressman would be strongly supportive of, which I think you would be. And, and you know, this county has a good relationship with Congressman Kiley, um, which was forged during his years in the state legislature here, so that, that is good, um, better than starting fresh. 
And I, I do think both senators are very familiar and will get hit hard on Tahoe projects. The transit is going to be the most important, whether it's micro mass transit or the transit lanes. They're not big into highway capacity, either one of them. From, um, so. Yeah. Okay. so what I'm hearing, forced health, biomass, employee services shared, and those are the main four, yep. assuming they're accepted. Yeah. Um, if, if I get a no from all members or most of the members, um, I may have to reach out to this board again to say, hey, where do we want to go? But in light of that, all, you know, I could work with the, the members' offices to see what, what they will go for um, and what's out there. Is, before I, I, you know, I don't want to stop, but before... Is there any else? other comments from board members? I see your light on, uh, Supervisor Gus. Oh, I'm so uh, sorry. All right, is there anyone in the public that wishes to address us on this item? Mm. Anybody online? <clears throat> okay, fine. So what I, what I will commit to to this board and, and Jane and, and Karen as well is I will keep you updated through this process, um, especially for the next six to eight weeks as these discussions start occurring here, uh, just to make sure you're all kept in the loop and aware. And then um, as we move forward, we'll get more individual board members involved in, in really advocating for these projects. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You betcha. What? Oh, you're going. I wonder where the hell you're going now. I see. Thanks. I'm glad you're on top of it. So this is uh, somewhere. Here. Twelve A. Twelve A. One thirty. Twelve A. This is, uh, we're going to look at you, 12 a.m. I'm getting there. Uh, a, a limited term property tax increment agreement, two by two appointments. This is with the uh, city of Lincoln. Am I correct? Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman, Board Members, Jane, Karen. Megan Wood, your clerk of the board. Um, so as you are aware, the board serves on a variety of boards and commissions, and we generally take those appointments in January. But I am back today with a special request. So in October uh, 2020, the board approved a limited term property tax increment agreement between the County of Placer and the City of Lincoln. Section 7.2 of this agreement says that the board and the city will form a two by two to review uh, and confer on the city's use of the limited term increment. So with that, I am here and I have two actions. The first is to ask your board to appoint two supervisors to serve on the limited term property tax increment agreement two by two and add this to the 2023 boards and commission assignments for which supervisors serve and also to determine that this proposed action is exempt from environmental review under the California Environmental Quality Act guideline section. So while this is only a request for the board to make an appointment, Shauna Pervine and Vanessa Lieberman are both here should you have questions on the agreement itself. All right, I, uh, I have a question. Uh, has there been any two by two meetings on this item in the past since uh, the decision was made? No, no, not at this time, I, uh, I believe your board's taking it today, and Lincoln might be taking it today as well, tonight, okay. so. And so, as far as uh, any um, oversight, is uh, the, uh, is Andy Zisk doing anything and went overseeing that, where that money spent, or? I will defer, on that portion, I will defer to Vanessa or Shauna. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the board, Vanessa Lieberman. There is staff oversight currently, um, so it's written into the agreement that it's a biennial review, so this fiscal year is what's triggering that two by two. Since the inception of this, they've been doing annual reporting, so there's been two fund reports. Oh, sorry. I say fund reports because they created a separate fund to a, account for this money, so it's very clearly they're recognizing the revenues and expending the funds. So we've had two reports, which has been reviewed by our office and has been shared with the auditor's office. So what is the role of the two by two uh, 
meetings. Sure. Yeah. I. Right oh, okay. Same. Same. <laughs> I will read directly from the agreement, but I do think that there, and I'll look to county council for this because I don't want to misspeak on maybe what the parameters are. But I do believe you know it's for discussion of how these monies are being expended, but also. You know, to me, these monies are one time. So how do they continue to support their public safety activity in perpetuity once this agreement ends? Because it is a limited term agreement. But I will read directly from what the um, agreement states, if that's OK. So commencing in fiscal year 2022-23, the parties agree that two members of the city council and two members of the county board of supervisors will meet to review and confer on the city's use of limited term increment over the prior two fiscal years, the city's progress in achieving the city's safety services and the county's mutual aid calls to the city for the same period of time. This biennial review shall continue for the duration of the term, including the extended term if triggered of this agreement. So as the city of Lincoln, I think they're supposed to start looking at a sales tax measure. Have they done anything in that regard? Do we know? I do not know. Okay. But yes, that is part of written into the agreement okay thank you uh supervisor Gustafson. i was just prepared to make a motion um but i you know i'll defer to anyone else with questions yeah go ahead well i i was gonna support supervisor landon and i thought supervisor gore to continue on on this but or not did you know i would serve? i would since i'm serving on the uh jpa i would prefer to be on the two by two with the city of Lincoln. Which JPA? The Liz, 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 Lizma or whatever it is. Liswa. Liswa. Well, I, I certainly think um, Supervisor Landon should serve on oh, it. Oh, absolutely. I, I, would, I would like to serve on it. And reason being um, is that I spent two years with the city of Lincoln pounding through getting to the point that we actually got an agreement. And I think that I've I spent two years of building goodwill um, to get to that point. I'd like to continue moving forward uh, with this effort. Can I just clarify something? This has nothing to do with sewer. Um, so, I mean, the, the tax exchange agreement that was entered into is to provide the city of Lincoln with additional funds for their public safety. And the intent of the two by two is to see how they've been using the funds that they've um, received from the county for the prior two fiscal years, where they're allocating that, how they're allocating it, what has changed, if anything, with the mutual aid calls that might be happening. In other words, are they appropriating the funds that they're getting through the tax agreement? appropriately to help bolster their public safety so that's the intent of the two by two is to have two members of the board and two members of the city uh, meet together to kind of look at the numbers and say what have you done here what have you done here uh, chair holmes ra raises a really good question what about the the sales tax initiative that is written into the agreement and one of the the prerequisites even consider an extension the the two-year extension of this agreement is whether that they've done that so it, it is an opportunity to discuss that scope of services. Well, then, my, my thinking on this, um, Supervisor Holmes, was just that Bonnie has a great background in city governance and city management. You're already participating on LISWA, where we wanted you to be as well. And I think having three board members work with the city of Lincoln was probably a good thing to build those relationships back. But, I, I, it's not, I'm not on my plate, so I'm so happy I, to I, nominate whomever. I have a good background in county government. Well, I'd like well no, to and so does Shanti <laughs> Landon. So. Can I make a comment on this? Yeah, I think it's got to take somebody with a, a, an eye on, you know, some experience in accounting and auditing as well, because the city of Lincoln's received one point, almost $1.7 million, um, and the thing that concerned me is that it says that the city did not have expenses, but has expended over a half a million. And so it just says generally related expenses, including salaries, benefits, and vehicles. I think this is going to take oversight by somebody with a keen eye 
on following details, not so much building relationships. I think you're going to have to have a hard nose when it comes to responding to these people because there are not many constituents out there that are really, that even like us giving them or sharing money or helping them out, where um, we've all seen cities start, begin, and most of them don't start their own police force. They, they contract with the county sheriff until they get up and running and they've got money coming in the door and then they know they can stand on their own two feet with employing their own um, police department. So I just think this is going to take, I know, Shanti, you're there. It's kind of your problem. <laughs> Sorry. It's my joy. <laughs> um, but I do think that it's going to take somebody who's real harsh. And I know um, that Supervisor Holmes took a hardcore attitude on this when we gave them money the last time. And so I don't know. I think that you're probably going to be harder on the city when it comes to facing the facts. Um, can I just uh, ask a question? Um, so this will just be an advisory committee, right? So they're not going to make any decisions no, without the oversight. board's knowledge. Yeah, so it's oversight. You're going to right. I just wanted to oversight. clarify that. Um, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, so uh, one other question: Will Andy's office will they be at all engaged in any of those conversations, or will it just be purely? A two by two with just the, those four people. City manager, will he be there? Staff oversees it. Yes. Mars, do you want it? Yeah. So it is set up as a two by two. Okay. So it, it, it you know, I, I, we have to be cautious. And Karen, feel free to, to chime in on this. It is, this is just a two board members, two city council members. I would assume that the city manager or the CEO might have interest in attending this, but I think this is really intended just to kind of sit down, go over the review. And I think staff can be brought in as necessary by the committee. But Aaron. just similar to the Middle Fork project or something else, staff do a lion's share of the work mm -hmm. to inform us, correct? Yes. Yeah, so staff will be producing everything that you're reviewing would be my assumption is that that's where the Karen shaking her head. Not necessarily. I mean, there there is a separate process that goes on every year between CEO staff and the auditor to look at what was what was transmitted to the city and what was expended. What did they spend the money on? So that process continues every year as long as this agreement is in place. Looking back and at how this came into being, I think the two by two, and I'm I'm reading a little into it, was was intended to help with the discussions and the conversation between the county and the city as to how the city is going to move themselves yep. forward to improve their public services. So I don't see it as something formal where you're going to be sitting with spreadsheets going, you know, this and that, although you may have that in front of you. In fact, that probably would inform you uh, per year. What have they done? What have they spent it on? Um, I think the, the, that informs you as to whether they're going to move forward with the sales tax initiative. That informs you as to whether to even consider an extension of this agreement when the time comes. So that's kind of what I saw it to be, having kind of lived through the background of the negotiations of this. Like all of our roles, I think it's policy yeah. driven by data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, well, I'll stand by. I'll make a motion to appoint. Uh, supervisors Landon and Gore to this committee. And I'll second that motion. Okay, motion by Gustafson, second by Gore to appoint Supervisor Landon and Supervisor Gore to the two by two um, tax increment agreement. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, can I add my notation with it or? Is that allowed? Well, let me finish. Okay. Those opposed? No. No. Any, any abstentions or? Chairman, I apologies for the interruption. Just for procedural, we do need to call for public comment on this item. Oh, I, yeah. Okay. Oh, that's right. <laughs> is there any public comment on this item? <laughs> Seeing none, is there anybody? I don't see any on that line. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Yes, go ahead. Okay, I was just going to give an explanation for my yes since I didn't give a comment, but uh, I, 
I really appreciate the fact that you have stepped up on LISWA and that you are participating and engaging with the city of Lincoln. And one of my biggest goals is to really um, repair a lot of the um, past relationships and kind of start fresh with Lincoln and hopefully start on a good note. And, um, and I think even though I agree that there is definite oversight that needs to happen and there will be times where you have to have a hard nose, I do think having Bonnie there will just because of the level of trust of knowing that she advocated for them throughout this process, I think will go a long way with them. So that is why I voted yes. Okay, I think that concludes the business before the board. And I want to adjourn the meeting in memory of Matt Lewis. So we are adjourned.